We will now move on to agenda item six, where the commission will hear a panel presentation on substance use disorders. Yesterday, the commission participated in a site visit where they accompanied street medicine teams who provided SUD treatment in the Skid Row area and Los Angeles General Hospital, where they toured the ER and had a roundtable discussion with treatment experts about the specific barriers to treatment. The work being done downtown is inspiring and also eye-opening. Today, we want to continue this discussion about opportunities to identify gaps and to support programs across the state that will address some of the barriers to accessing care that we heard about yesterday. Commissioner Danovich, before we turn it over to the panel, I wanted to provide you with an opportunity to share your thoughts on yesterday's site visit and also where you feel it would be important for the commission to focus its attention. Great, thank you. Um, I would just say um, really briefly that this is a long overdue initiative. Um, as we all know, um, historically, substance use services were separated from mental health services, were separated from medical services, and uh, you know, we all deal on a daily basis with the unintended consequences of those separations as we try to piece the system back together. Um, that separation was also built into this act when it was first written, and uh, that's now been remedied so that this act can be used for all mental illnesses, not just mental illnesses that don't include substance use disorder. And, um, and so it's very exciting to have an initiative that focuses on that. Um, staff did a really terrific job of putting together an outstanding set of, I mean, what do you do? How do you, how do you give the commission a glimpse of substance use disorder in a day? Um, it's sort of an impossible act that they um, put together a really, really um, compelling and uh, intense and, um, and moving day. And part of what was so moving and intense and, and compelling about it was, you know, seeing firsthand the incredible work that's done on a regular basis on the front lines um, of this city, um, uh, dealing with the problems that exist all across the state and, uh, and the nation. So um, really appreciate it for that and look forward to hear from our panel um, about each of their views of the system and opportunities. And I think that um, once the commission decides to move forward with, um, uh, with designating this initiative to substance use, we can specifically hone in on uh, what opportunity we want to tackle, recognizing that everything we're going to hear about is really compelling, and uh, we need to figure out what we can bite off or we can have an impact with the resources that we have and given the constraints that we deal with. So thank you, and I'll turn it over to our panel. Madam Chair, <clears throat> I found yesterday, as someone who does not work at all in the system, uh, so it was my first exposure, I found yesterday to be hugely impactful on a personal le level and, and certainly impactful in terms of our role here at the commission. Um, you know, I, ju I, I commented to somebody last night, I was texting, I said, I observed a day where we are traumatizing the traumatized because um, my, my lens on this is through the neuroscience, what I know about the neurobiology of the brain. And my view of this is that everyone on the street is in crisis mode, and um, this just highlights the continuing inequity between how we treat health care in every other part and how we treat mental health, and that, that, that mental health, that, that our, the brain that is the root cause of the, the mental health is not being treated like every other organ. If uh, pe when people have heart attacks, we rush them to the hospital and stabilize them, and then we de then we once we've stabilized them, then we deal with the other issues. But here, I just saw people all over the place having heart attacks, and we were asking them to go through assessments and fill out forms and trying to navigate a system that you know, I couldn't figure out, and, and they're in their fight and flight mode. It's no, no wonder why that they are uh, in crisis. And so it just makes me wonder, how is it that yet again we have a broken system that's not better coordinated? And at the same time, to see the heroic effort 
of all the people on the streets who are trying to work in this incredibly broken system to deliver services to people who, um, you know, they they care about and love. And, uh, you know, the, the bit, and I'm sorry I'm going on, but, you know, the thing that I kept being struck by were several people saying, you know, these people have hopes and dreams and aspirations, and I think it's easy for all of us not to see these people as, as human beings anymore that have hopes and dreams and aspirations, and I think it makes them human, and it's a reminder of how important they are, and that if we can address the needs of these people, then we should be able to address everybody's needs, and so I just thank you for the opportunity to uh, participate yesterday. Thank you, Commissioner Carnevale. Any other comments? And we, well, we can make comments too um, afterwards. I want to thank you for being here. Um, I know it was something I, I work in schools, and so one of the things I kept talking about continuum and how do we get to prevention. And um, but it, it's the lives, right? It's the lives. Nobody wakes up and, and and wants to live this life. And and yet there's such judgment around SUD, and I think that's a, a societal thing. We, we place judgment like people made these choices to live like this. And um, I look forward to learning what we can do. Um, in my own personal life, I'm dealing with a family member. And so how, how do we address this? Because it can't be about judgment. We can't just make assumptions and, and then not move forward. So um, thank you for being here today. And I'm going to hand it over to Tom to uh, right. get us started with this. Thank so you, Chairman Andrew Gawais and Commissioners. I want to get right to the panel, but first um, I'd like to provide you with a, a brief background on the funding that's available uh, for the Commission uh, uh, to support the substance use uh, disorder efforts, um, how we've allocated the mental health wellness funds in the past, and then outline some of the goals for today's discussion. On the funding piece, the Commission has 20, uh, their budget includes uh, $20 million per year uh, through the Mental Health Wellness Act to provide grants to programs that address crisis prevention, uh, early intervention, and crisis response services. Um, in October of 2021, uh, the Commission identified five priorities for these funds, strategies to uh, reduce unnecessary hospitalizations, uh, also programs to meet the behavioral health needs of older adults, substance use disorder programs, <clears throat> opportunities to support services for children zero to five, and peer respite programs. Last year at this time, the Commission allocated two years of funding, uh, $40 million, to expand um, uh, mobile support programs for older adults uh, through AgeWise and PEARLS programs, and to expand the number of empath crisis stabilization units that are adjacent to and on the grounds of hospitals. Uh, so our goal in assembling uh, this panel of experts is to assist the Commission uh, as it explores opportunities to identify, uh, fill gaps in the continuum of care or address barriers that we heard so much about yesterday uh, in accessing substance use disorder um, services. So $20 million is, is not a lot of money uh, to address all of these needs, um, uh, all the needs that exist in, in, in California, but it does provide an opportunity for the Commission uh, to expand SUD uh, approaches that respond to urgent needs. It gives the opportunity to also potentially pilot new approaches, to incentivize partnerships where that needs to happen, and to support innovative approaches in financing and effective um, service delivery. So with that, I would uh, like to introduce uh, all of you to our first panelist. We'll begin with Tyler Sadwith. Um, Tyler's joining us remotely. Tyler Sadwith was appointed by Governor Newsom as the Deputy Director of Behavioral Health at the California Department of Healthcare Services. Tyler's responsible for leading DHCS uh, and all of their efforts to ensure high quality and accessible specialty mental health and substance use disorder services in Medi-Cal and other public programs. Thank you for being with us today, Tyler. You can go ahead and begin your presentation. Thank you, Tom. Um, and just to check in on housekeeping, um, I, sh uh, I should share my screen and present um, presentation materials myself. If you could do that, that would be great. Otherwise, we can we can do that. But if you you can share the, you share your screen, that would be great. Yep, I can absolutely do that. Um, 
Uh, can I can uh, someone just confirm that you can see the we presentation see up? Yep, we can see it. Thank you. Excellent. Um, well, thank you and good morning, um, uh, Commission members and everybody. I apologize for not being able to join in person um, due to prior conflicts, but I am privileged and grateful to be able to meet with you all to discuss uh, this incredible opportunity. I think someone. Uh, struck it well when they said uh, we can't discuss uh, all uh, SUD funding in one afternoon. So hopefully this is uh, the start of an ongoing um, conversation. I know we have other panelists that will be highlighting the excellent and innovative work that they are leading across the state. So what I'd like to do is sort of just set the table and provide some foundational context. First, I'll just highlight uh, the various funding sources for substance use disorder uh, prevention, treatment, and recovery resources in the state. Then I'll highlight the current landscape for substance use disorder innovation grant making because uh, DHCS um, is heavily involved in this space. Um, and uh, I think this is relevant for the commission's discussion. Then I'll just share a couple starting point thoughts about some opportunities that the commission might consider and then happy to answer any questions or participate in a discussion. So I'm gonna breeze through this. Um, this I'm gonna go a little bit rapid fire um, because I recognize I have only about 10 minutes. So just as context, uh, DHCS, the Department of Healthcare Services is the California State Medicaid Agency. We also are the federally designated state, uh, single state agency for substance abuse and the state mental health authority. Um, we cover approximately one in three Californians and the uh, annual Medicaid spend uh, from three years ago was about 600 million and the grant funding was nearly 1 billion. Uh, these numbers are increasing. Um, I'd highlight that the Medicaid expenditures for SUD services are um, sort of disproportionately smaller than they are for specialty mental health services. And that's something we continue to pay attention to. Uh, we uh, also are uh, at the department administering opioid settlement funding, which was not captured on the prior slide. So currently and through the next uh, near future, we will be administering a few billion dollars that we receive through opioid uh, litigation and settlements, the majority of which will go to cities and counties. Um, and some will be administered by the state. Uh, to set the landscape for providers, we license and certify SUD providers. There are approximately uh, 900 in the state. Uh, about a quarter of them participate in Medi-Cal. We oversee uh, ASAM, American Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, level of care designation for residential providers. Uh, there are about 800 certified outpatient providers, about uh, nearly half participate in Medi-Cal. Prior to this year, certification for outpatient providers was optional, but uh, the Budget Act of last year requires outpatient providers uh, to obtain certification, so this will be mandatory. Medi-Cal, as uh, I'm sure everyone knows, has a complicated delivery system for behavioral health services. Uh, some uh, behavioral health services are delivered through managed care plans. Some are delivered through uh, non-risk, non-capitated managed care plans that counties administer as mental health plans. Those are specialty mental health services. For substance use disorder services, historically, they were administered through a fee-for-service carve-out program with a limited benefit. Um, but as I'll walk through, uh, and I know uh, Dr. Sai from Los Angeles will highlight, uh, the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System, or the DMC ODS, covers at this point 97% of the Medi-Cal population, where 38 counties voluntarily participate as uh, managed care plans to deliver a comprehensive benefit uh, uh, aligned uh, through the ASAM uh, criteria. So just as background, this is a, a, a CMS flexibility to cover services not otherwise coverable under Medicaid, including residential treatment and IMDs. Um, we received approval in 2015. ASAM is really the pillar and the cornerstone for it. Um, and right now, uh, California was the first state to receive this type of approval and 33 other states have followed our lead. Um, at the moment, DHCS is pursuing a similar opportunity to expand mental health care and Medi-Cal under the BH Connect demonstration. Um, we plan to submit that to CMS later this year, and we just concluded our public comment period. 
This uh, provides a snapshot, uh, uh, sort of a comparison of what used to be covered under drug Medi-Cal, it's a limited benefit, and what is covered now in the comprehensive benefit package available for counties that participate in uh, the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system. Um, so as you can see, 97% uh, of patients have access to services they don't otherwise have access to, including recovery services, care coordination, uh, residential treatment in IMDs, contingency management, and others. Um, some initial findings uh, include some positive outcomes, including high patient satisfaction rates, a 30% reduction in re-overdose rates, and increase uh, increases in 30-day retention in, in, uh, in treatment. Um, we also know uh, that the uh, patients are ending up uh, accessing levels of care that track and that align with their initial screenings and their initial assessments. So more information is available in our independent evaluation. One uh, interesting uh, innovative benefit I want to highlight in the DMC ODS is we, we were the first state in the nation to receive approval to cover contingency management in the Medicaid program. We have uh, 24 counties covering 88% of Medi-Cal opting in to implement contingency management, which is the intervention with the strongest base of evidence for improving outcomes for individuals with stimulant use disorder. Um, this is not only um, incredibly important because stimulant use disorder is uh, uh, something California has historically and continues to grapple with, with meth use, but also because overdose uh, deaths um, uh, continue to primarily involve uh, combined use of stimulant use disorder and fentanyl. So this is a key intervention in our uh, overdose response strategy. So now I'd like to just sort of highlight uh, the current landscape for SUD innovation grant making. Um, I think this is helpful context because uh, my hope for today is that uh, the commission um, uh, sort of understands uh, and gets excited about uh, those those opportunities in the SUD innovation space um, where uh, 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 the commission could align with or build upon or uh, leverage opportunities the department has not covered today. Um, but uh, I want to highlight that under the California MAT expansion project, we have been administering um, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of federal uh, SAMHSA grant funding to uh, really invest in the prevention, uh, early intervention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction continuum across the state, where we're accelerating uh, uh, the implementation of evidence-based practices and engaging all sectors of the healthcare system, not just the specialty SUD providers that historically had remained responsible for addressing this issue. Um, so just as context, uh, the Congress started passing um, uh, state opioid response grants in uh, 2017. They continued to pass these. And since then, we have administered $650 million in uh, SUD grant funding across the state. These have resulted in uh, 174,000 new people receiving evidence-based uh, medications for addiction treatment including 25,000 patients receiving uh, uh, treatment for stimulant use disorder. The, we have expanded uh, access points to medications for addiction treatment in 650 locations across the state. And we currently administer 30 projects that, again, cover opioid use disorder, fentanyl uh, awareness and interventions, naloxone distribution, and stimulant use disorder strategies specifically. Our website uh, has information about all of these innovative programs. They include everything from providing funding and TA to FQHCs and primary care centers to implement MAT, working with emergency medical services to initiate buprenorphine, uh, uh, supporting uh, warm lines for clinician to clinician consultation on substance use disorder, um, and the California Bridge Program, which Dr. Mullen will describe, where the majority of hospitals have implemented MAT and navigator services in the emergency departments. We have supported 37 counties to implement MAT in their jails. Um, we have provided um, sort of an equity anchored approach to supporting um, uh, uh, MAT and uh, substance use disorder awareness, prevention, treatment, and intervention in 
uh, community-based organizations uh, across the state, including those that uh, uh, primarily serve uh, populations experiencing disparities. Um, and I'll highlight uh, a few of these um, uh, as well. The Naloxone Distribution Project has distributed 3 million units of naloxone, uh, resulting in um, over 200,000 reported overdose reversals. Um, I mentioned the uh, expanding MAT in jails, drug courts, and county criminal justice systems. Um, I apologize, I said 37 counties, this is actually 41 counties have participated in this project. Um, and the MAT access points really has focused on engaging those communities that uh, historically have experienced um, disparities um, and uh, specific communities across California through targeted um, messaging and outreach uh, to support local infrastructure to reach communities uh, most at need um, in historically underserved communities. And Dr. Molan will highlight the California Bridge Program, which has just achieved incredible results uh, and where California is a, a leading state in the nation. So in terms of opportunities, um, I would highlight that I think a, a top uh, opportunity for the commission to consider is expanding access and the infrastructure for low threshold or low barrier uh, uh, treatment providers that provide medications to addiction treatment, which have the strongest evidence base. Um, right now, um, uh, you know, uh, accessing medications for addiction treatment and treatment can be challenging. Um, and due to uh, insurance requirements and out, you know, operating hours and prior authorization and extensive assessments. Um, sometimes folks drop out of treatment or don't show up or don't stick around. So one uh, immediate thing that can save lives in California is supporting our SUD providers and other healthcare providers to offer low barrier access to outpatient medications for addiction treatment. Um, some of these exist in California today, and I think this is a key opportunity to scale and expand. One other opportunity to consider is integration with substance use disorder and medical care. Um, there are a couple bright spots in California where SUD providers have become federally qualified health centers and provide fully integrated care. This is not only great to provide and meet the uh, provide great care and meet the needs of patients, including patients um, managing uh, infectious diseases but it also enhances revenue streams for substance use disorder providers, um, which is key to supporting scaling and sustainability. Um, so I think this is something I've personally been interested in um, and I haven't seen California uh, nudge, nudge this or provide resources to SUD providers to pursue this. And the final uh, area for opportunity for consideration from my humble perspective would be supporting the specialty SUD provider network to develop clinical competencies to be what is called uh, co-occurring capable by ASAM. Uh, co-occurring uh, uh, capable, uh, I'm sorry, co-occurring enhanced providers. Co-occurring capable providers are SUD providers that are able to treat patients with co-occurring mental health conditions that are manageable and that are not severe. Um, what this means is that individuals with co-occurring conditions with complex or serious mental illness that are not managed or stabilized um, are often unable to be admitted to addiction treatment centers. So uh, supporting uh, SUD providers to become co-occurring enhanced, uh, which is a term from ASAM, to be able to really uh, meet these needs of uh, patients with dual diagnoses would improve outcomes for uh, uh, Californians across the state. So I know that was a lot of information. And uh, you know, again, my number one uh, hope is that this is an opportunity to start the conversation. The department looks forward to uh, continuing to support the commission with assessing opportunities for the SUD innovation grant funding. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Appreciate it. That's uh, what we're looking for today is a specific opportunities like you just laid out. And so um, with that, I think we'll move to our, our next panelist and hear from Dr. Gary Sai, who you referenced. Uh, Dr. Gary Sai is the uh, Director of Substance Use Prevention and Control, a division of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. In his role, he oversees a full spectrum of substance use programs. Um, 
um, such as uh, harm prevention or harm reduction and, and treatment services for the 10 million residents of Los Angeles County. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sai, for being here today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commission, for um, your interest in this topic. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to run through my slides relatively briefly um, because um, uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time um, providing some more concrete ideas around um, how some of these funds could be leveraged in an um, optimal way. Uh, I have a couple goals today. Um, one is so that the Commission gets a better sense of what the specialty SUV system does. Um, and then two is to highlight what some of the opportunities are in terms of um, investments. Um, the first couple slides are more background in terms of um, what my agency does, which is similar to what a lot of especially SUD agencies do across the state, which is um, overseeing the specialty prevention and treatment and recovery systems. Um, uh, we also offer a fairly expansive network of harm reduction agencies here. That there's some variability across counties around harm reduction, um, but that's essentially the scope of our responsibilities. One way to think of the special SUD system is similar to the special mental health, except it's focused on SUD issues. As Dr. Danovich had highlighted, um, the Medi-Cal carve-outs you know, are carved out according to physical health, especially mental health especially substance use, also known as drug Medi-Cal. And so drug Medi-Cal is essentially what specialty SUD systems oversee. Um, this slide is actually very similar. You'll, you'll know that uh, uh, Tyler and I do present quite a bit together, and so that this is a similar slide to what he had presented. Um, so I'm not going to go through it in detail. I think the main takeaway is that with implementation of the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system uh, back in 2017, which was when Los Angeles County implemented um, the scope of services covered under Medi-Cal expanded significantly. Um, previously, and this was just 2016, right, which isn't that long ago, um, only perinatal women uh, could receive Medi-Cal reimbursable residential substance use treatment. If you were a man who needed residential substance use treatment, Medi-Cal would not cover it. And so I highlight that because 2016 is not that uh, you know, it's only seven years ago or so. And so I, I think that that gives us a good sense of where uh, the drug Medi-Cal systems are starting from and the work that we have ahead of us. One of the key changes with the drug Medi-Cal organized delivery system waiver was also how we were financed because similar to the waiver that specialty mental health systems implemented back in 1995, the ability to uh, leverage Medi-Cal as the primary payer of services allowed us to um, identify and use other funding that we were using to pay for SUD services in other more expansive ways. And so the key change with one of the key changes with the drug Medi-Cal wa waiver was drug Medi-Cal becoming the primary payer, all of our other secondary sources then being able to be leveraged for um, other things, other priorities. Um, this slide highlights the various levels of care. So when we talk about a continuum of services. Earlier, um, I had mentioned that we're responsible for the prevention system. Uh, we work with uh, networks of schools. We work with Department of Parks and Recreation. We work with libraries, uh, uh, in particular around positive youth development programs, peer leadership programs to really invest upstream in our youth. Um, this slide highlights our treatment system. And so when we talk about the continuum through the treatment lens, we're talking about different levels of care whether they're recovery services, outpatient services, intensive outpatient, different intensities of residential services, different intensities of withdrawal management, otherwise known as detox, um, or opioid treatment programs, um, which are otherwise known as methadone clinics. Um, we also offer things outside of the Medi-Cal benefit, such as recovery bridge housing, which is re uh, recovery-oriented housing, um, for individuals who need a safe, recovery-oriented living environment, oftentimes because they are um, experiencing homelessness. Um, some of the numbers highlighted here um, highlight uh, the outcomes of the drug Medi-Cal waiver and what we've been able to do, largely because we've been able to leverage Medi-Cal, um, saving you know, 50 to 90 percent on the dollar um, and reinvest those other monies elsewhere. So um, our prevention budget has increased by 
uh, 260 percent. Our treatment bud budget has increased by 275 percent. We've increased residential beds by um, uh, a significant amount. Sorry, I don't have my glasses with me. Um, and uh, Recovery Bridge Housing, which was uh, really a benefit that previously was wholly covered by the county, um, which is still covered by the county, but we, we expanded beds significantly there as well, uh, and, our, and our harm reduction budget expanded by 500%. So um, this just highlights the expansion that's occurred since implementation of the waiver, uh, and there's a lot more room for us, a lot more work for us to do to grow the SUD system so that we can actually achieve the integrated behavioral health system that we've talked about across the state for many years now. Um, so to highlight some of the opportunities, one of them is CalAIM. I'm not going to get into details about CalAIM just because, although I'm happy to talk about it later, um, you know, I, I think that there's been a lot of time spent on CalAIM. Um, but just to highlight, there are a lot of different arms or pillars of CalAIM. One of them is payment reform, which I do think is a very significant opportunity for us to be smart, strategic with the way that we're financing our behavioral health system as opposed to approaching financing from a more transactional perspective. Um, one of the, the innovations uh, and recent initiatives that we've launched is called Reaching in 95%. And what this uh, highlights is that um, the majority of people with substance use disorders don't receive services. Uh, and the majority of those who don't receive services, and that's the 95%, say that they didn't receive services because they don't think that they need them. And so while we have supply issues on the substance use treatment side in terms of needing to grow capacity, right, and we've had some opportunities um, because of state investments, for example, through the Behavioral Health Continuum Infrastructure Program, um, you know, Behavioral Health Bridge Housing, which is coming, um, we also have a very significant demand issue that I don't think that we talk about enough. And that's really what the Reaching 95% or R95 initiative is focused on. It's focused on ensuring that our treatment system is designed not just for the 5% of people who are knocking on our door, but for the 95% of people who aren't knocking on our door, but really should be. Um, and there are a lot of different components to this. Uh, I don't have time to go through all of the components, um, but just to highlight uh, some of them, some of them are um, really maximizing outreach and engagement, expanding field-based services. These are Medi-Cal reimbursable services out in the field. Currently, we provide um, some of them in interim housing settings, but we can s expand that significantly. And because it's Medi-Cal reimbursable, are able to leverage the federal financial participation um, or the federal match. Um, other components of R95 are um, really operationally working with our treatment provider network to re-examine admissions and discharge policies with the aim to um, lower the bar for admissions and raise the bar for discharges. And specifically what I mean by that is that right now a lot of substance use uh, treatment agencies, and this is across the nation, right, require abstinence in order to be considered for treatment. And I think that um, society at large has associated abstinence, readiness for abstinence with readiness for treatment. We need to break that. And the reason why we need to break that is because it's too high of a bar. And it's akin to saying to someone with diabetes that unless your blood sugar is below 200, you're not ready for treatment yet. Come back when your blood sugar is below 200. And clearly, um, in our primary care clinics, we don't do that. If someone comes in with a blood sugar of 600, we say, wow, you really need our help. Let's get you on some, some medication, talk to you about you know, lifestyle changes, right? Um, and so that's a fundamental aim of R95 is addressing that. And in terms of raising the discharge bar, similarly, um, people uh, oftentimes are discharged when they relapse. Um, now, there are some times when that may be appropriate, but there are other times where um, I think we're too ready to discharge individuals for exhibiting a symptom of their condition. And so that's a, another element of better reaching the 95%. So it's about creating the environment and also other um, focuses, for example, on things as simple as lighting, right? Sterile white lighting is less welcoming in general than soft white lighting, paying attention to furniture, paying attention to kind of the environment that we create for those who have been in environments that have been inviting. Um, the whole goal of every interaction we have with clients with SUD should about be about how we better engage those individuals, right? Um, and so that's the, the aim of R95. Um, just to jump 
briefly, uh, I do think that with this opportunity with, um, and there's some other slides here about our payment reform approach, which incorporates the R95 initiative, um, but because of the level of detail in our time, I'm gonna just breeze through those um, and spend the last couple minutes focused on, uh, you know, I do think that there's a tremendous opportunity here for the commission to consider investing these funds uh, broadly, um, consistent with the continuum of services that are needed to address the varied needs of the population we serve, inclusive of prevention. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, SUD systems have been underfunded for many years. Um, Tyler had mentioned the disparity between uh, specialty uh, mental health funding comprising 90% of the specialty behavioral health budget under Medi-Cal in California and drug Medi-Cal comprising 10%. That has resulted in a lot of things. One of the things that's resulted in is a system that really needs to grow and hasn't had the resources to, for example, hire prescribers who can offer MAT. That's why one of the things that you'll hear, uh, I believe, from this panel today is that one of the investments um, really should be around how we scale MAT in different ways, right? Within the specialty SUD system, outside of the specialty SUD system. And so I do think that there are different ways that we can do that. Um, we have a cost sharing uh, program that we're considering right now that I think would be a worthwhile investment to address the primary bear uh, of specialty SUD programs in not being able to hire anyone because they haven't had the resources. And because we just implemented payment reform, there's an opportunity for us to build this runway where we share costs uh, for the first year, maybe 70 to 80 percent of that cost, um, and then next year bring that down to about 50 percent or so so that that buys those agencies a couple years to stabilize with pay the higher payment reform rates and then sustain that staffing. And we continue to do that in order to grow the number of MAP prescribers within the specialty SUD system. Um, I agree with Tyler that there are important opportunities to invest in low barrier MAP access. Um, some of that, I think the commission had an opportunity to see yesterday in terms of street-based services. Um, that would be a worthwhile investment. Um, I also agree. Um, with the investment in FQHCs and how we can uh, grow capacities there to supplement um, the core uh, SUD services provided in the special SUD system. Um, on the prevention side, I think that there are a lot of opportunities to invest in our youth, in particular with um, uh, positive youth development programming and leadership development programming. Um, this quote, I think, highlights um, why that's important in terms of the opposite of addiction not being sobriety, but the opposite of addiction actually being connection. And to the extent that we can build those connections among our youth, we can prevent some of the downstream issues. Although I do think that a lot of the funding um, would need to focus on, Matt, things on the treatment side just because we are in the worst overdose crisis in history and we need to be making decisions um, accordingly. And so um, last night after our site visit, I did spend some time writing up a, a, a brief um, uh, proposal for how funds might be spent. Happy to go over those details, but I know I've probably spent more than the allotted time. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sai. We will have time for discussion after all the presentations. Um, but uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Rebecca Trotsky, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, organizing our site visit yesterday. As uh, Commissioner Danovich said, it was compelling and, and very helpful to see that. Uh, doc, Dr. Uh, Trotsky, sir, is a physician in family medicine with a subspecialty in addiction medicine. She, uh, currently, she is uh, director of addiction and community medicine at the medical and medical director of jail ward services at Los Angeles General Medical Center, uh, which we visited yesterday, and the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services. Uh, thank you for being here. You can begin. Yeah, there you are. Hello, I learned technology. Um, so, so, so happy to be on this panel. You have a, a wide range of experts, um, and many things are true at the same time. Both we need to increase funding and support and um, training for the specialty addiction medicine services, as well as all these other things. So yesterday we saw a bunch of system failures, and at the same time the system is working really well. So there's two things that are true at the same time. Um, I really want to highlight the all-in access for addiction care for people who show up wherever they show up, whenever they show up, and that's, I think, what we'll hear over and over again, that we need to meet people where they're at, no matter what. 
So we know that substance use disorder is common among people who have mental health issues and behavioral health issues, it's comorbid. And in specific, more and more we're seeing um, the role of stimulants co-occurring with psychosis and schizophrenia, which we saw a lot yesterday in the streets. So that really significant, severe behavioral health issue we need to address on both fronts. And right now there's challenges and difficulty when we have a fragmented care delivery system that tends to focus just on one element. Um, we have talked a lot about how people are experiencing homelessness at an increasing rate at the same time as the counties are getting better and better at delivering services to that population. So many things are true at the same time. Um, so why don't people just stop using drugs? There's a lot of behavioral issues and there's a lot of brain changes that happen. And with opioids, um, one of the magnificent technologies that we have at our disposal are medications for addiction treatment that help normalize and regulate the brain. When my patients tell me that they've started Suboxone or Buprenorphine, which is a treatment for opioid use disorder, they tell me they feel like their old selves again before they started using drugs. They tell me like they felt like a 15 year old again. And this is exactly what I want for them. I want them to be able to be stabilized, to feel well again. Um, and we know when people don't have these medications as best as their intentions are when they leave, a, you know, a rehab program that's focusing on abstinence, they get back to the same people, places, and things that trigger their use and they return to their use patterns. So it's important to understand that our social mm, story around addiction, that you just have to work hard enough and pray hard enough and you know, stop using drugs and it's a behavioral choice, that's a myth and it's hard to undo those social stories. And part of the system change that we get to do is rewrite those stories as we transform healthcare systems. There's really three things of things that I do as, as a physician. And you know, sometimes when you talk about this, you're like, this is really oversimplifying it, yet it's important to understand. Any disease, including addiction, you have three pillars that help promote health. And this also includes for general wellness. You have medications, you have counseling, individualized counseling with a trained expert, and you have support. And those supports can be housing supports. They can be a lot of different kinds of supports. When we're in the hospital system that you saw yesterday, a lot of the times we're focused on medications that what we have available. And for opioid use disorder, this is one of the most extremely effective treatments. So medications alone will help people make those behavioral changes in their lives for opioid use disorder. That is not the same for other kinds of substance use disorder like some of our stimulants. We're still working on those medications. We have some, they're not as effective as buprenorphine and naloxone. So it's important to recognize that depending on the substance use disorder you have, those sides of those triangles are bigger or smaller. Opioid use disorder, medications, and that's why we were really focused on how do you get medications in mouth and that, that last mile connection and how do we start them from any and every point. So um, I always want to just remind people what buprenorphine is. If you have not heard about it, I could talk about it all day. Um, she is our queen. So buprenorphine is a medication that when you put her in your mouth and take it every day. This is the graph that really transformed my medical care. So 30 days post ER stay or 30 days post hospitalization stay, people have health outcomes that are good and bad. Um, looking at mortality and norming the all population mortality as one, right? Like so after 30 days, some people will pass away. That rate is gonna be just one. When you have opioid use disorder, that rate is six. So you're dying six times higher just because you have opioid use disorder. And that's with our standard system of care. So you got a photocopy of a 1-800 number, please stop using drugs. You got the referral to your primary care doctor that maybe did or did not have time to see you. You got connected to Gary Sai's wonderful treatment programs, but maybe you went, maybe you didn't go. If you don't get medications for opioid use disorder, you will have a six times higher rate of death within 30 days, leaving the ER, leaving the hospital. When you put medications in mouth, that decreases three to four fold. So that's that blue line underneath there. And those medications, there's really only three medications. You've heard methadone, which is a full on um, opioid that kind of helps regulate people's cravings for opioid. Buprenorphine is this queen in the middle that's both on and off that opioid receptor, helps stabilize that opioid part of the brain. And then you have naltrexone, which is um, basically like a long-acting Narcan that's completely blocking the opioid part of the brain. Those are the only three medications we have for opioid use disorder. They are all equally effective. Buprenorphine has a number of regulatory mechanisms that make it more elegant and able for physicians like myself to prescribe it and people to pick it up in pharmacies. Methadone is one of the most highly regulated federally um, 
drugs available and it requires people to go to a special center, a methadone clinic, and show up every day to get medications. There's a lot of jumps and hurdles for people to access methadone. It's an amazing medication and we put a lot of barriers in place that will be hard to undo. That's why I focus on buprenorphine. Um, once you understand kind of the importance of medications for reducing death and reducing lethality and improving wellness for people who have opioid use disorder, which as Dr. Sai was saying, is one of the most increasing causes of deaths in our community, you understand how important that medication is. First line, first thing, we need it at the door. We need it in the ERs, we need it in the hospitals. We need every single clinician to feel comfortable and confident providing that to their patient. Maybe we're recognizing that patient needs care at time of OB care, maybe it's a pediatrician, maybe it's during cancer treatment, maybe it's during surgery. All of these things, it's important for those providers to be able to be fluent in providing care. And if they're not, Sound? I lost sound, James. I cannot hear them. Okay. So it's been kind of hard. Are you having problems hearing too? It just went out for me right now. Okay. Me too. Oh, so we're not alone. Yeah. Let me, uh, I'll text Toby, let him know that we can't hear. I just sent him a text. Uh, he said they're working on it. Thank you. Thanks for the update. Yep. Thank you. Um, please hold. We're having some technical issues and we will be with you shortly. The meeting has been paused. Thank you.
cultural story. Of that, I think we are up and ready to go. So we'll get going again here. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. So thank you so much as uh, my brilliant prior comments. Uh, so amazing. So um, I, I have here, this has become our screensavers at the Department of Health Services, which highlights our medication for addiction treatment consult line. This is a 24 seven available line to all of our clinicians. And you heard yesterday from our pharmacist who said prior to the existence of this, this line, he was delivering in Skid Row one or two prescriptions a month for buprenorphine. And you can say, well, was that because we didn't have an addiction problem in Skid Row? Was that because we were so amazingly blessed that there wasn't that problem? Or was it because we did not have access to treatment? And the latter is significantly true. Once we delivered this low barrier, anybody can come all in access point, his prescriptions for buprenorphine are now 10 a day. So we just, you know, like I said, we wiped out downtown LA from the available treatment centers our first day of operation because we lowered that threshold and we made it widely available for clinicians and for the community. And this is the kind of treatment that I think is easily scalable. You know, everything that Dr. Sai said is also important. We need these foundational supports for our community. And the wonderful thing about your commission is that you have an opportunity to fund these edges and these innovation points that are super high yield. If this kind of model was available in every county, it would allow that expansion as quickly as we were able to expand in Los Angeles. One of the, the important things was it was an all-in thing. So it didn't need to have you be a signed up member of Medi-Cal. It did not need you to be a signed up member of my healthcare system. It was an all-in point. In addition to accessing treatment, you also um, saw yesterday the importance of having messaging around so you still are continuing to use drugs and I still care for you. And these are the ways to do things more safely. So there are a set of universal precautions for the safer use of drugs. And this is something that's really hard for providers to understand. It's really hard for certain community members to understand. It is not hard for drug users to understand that there's a safer way to use drugs and can you please help me get there? Building the bridge between those communities is significant. So the message is, you know, start low, go slow, use with a friend, have naloxone at your side, test your drugs for fentanyl. These are all important messages that we all can be providing. So whenever I see a patient who uses drugs, um, you know, this concept of are you ready for treatment no longer exists. This is the universal message I'm giving everybody. Like everybody, when we were in COVID, we were all wearing masks. We were all doing universal precautions to stay safe. When people use drugs, we're doing universal precautions to stay safe. These are some of the messages I want to give to my community. And it's no shame one way or the other. I, I have treatment available for you. Here it is. Rather than let me give you a 10-page questionnaire to see if you're ready to accept my, question, you know, my, my services. If I am simply saying, I have pizza, are you hungry? That's a very different message than saying, let me assess your hunger you know, on a 10-point scale. So it's a yeah, would you like to be put on hold for two hours to see if you can be eligible for pizza, right? Like, it's a different message. So it's super important to be able to deliver all of these things. And, you know, I say them very calmly and, you know, they're now part of my everyday. But when I first started seven years ago, this was new to me and I stumbled over my words and I needed leaders to help, you know, like providers and Dr. Gary Sai's team really to help coach me through how to do this effectively, efficiently. We saw how busy that ER was yesterday. We need to be able to do this in five minutes. We can't wait 50 minutes and back everybody up more and more and more until the hallways. 
Um, the other universal safer use of drug precautions that I always tell people are things like never use alone. There's hotlines that you, you can have available. Um, the opioid overdose naloxone, which you all will get today. It's that message of keep calm and carry naloxone. Like I hope that you reach health in all these different ways. And also here's the other message. So I think that's the end of my slides. Thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have lots of conversations. Dr. Amy Wu. Great, thank you, Dr. Trotsky. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Amy Mullen, uh, a professor at UC Davis with a dual appointment in the, uh, the Department of Emergency uh, Medicine and Psychiatry. She is board certified in both emergency medicine and addiction medicine, and is the founder of California Bridge, an effort to expand low threshold access to treatment for people with substance use disorders. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, so I started out, I'm an emergency physician. So what you said, Commissioner, really resonated with me is this is, you know, we take people with heart attacks very seriously. And I think the same for people who are using drugs. The one year mortality rate for someone with a heart attack is the same as someone with an overdose. And so I really need to think about this as someone who has a life threatening emergency because it's the similar mortality. And so as an ER doctor, yes, that absolutely resonates me. And should we be scooping folks up and getting them started on treatment now? Absolutely. I 100% hear you. And that to me is equity, is to recognize that this is a treatable, life-threatening emergency and should be treated with the same resources and urgency as a heart attack because the mortality is the same. This is what we, I talk about this a lot, and this is really the motto of California Bridge. All people deserve rapid access to evidence-based treatment. And I think, I see your heads nodding, like this resonates with us. But then let's dig in and think about how well we do this. All people. What if you have out-of-county Medi-Cal? What if your Medi-Cal card is expired? What if you don't have an ID? transportation, the ability to show up on time. You don't have a cell phone with Wi-Fi access. And to think about how many people we are missing and excluding based on the system that we have developed. Rapid access. And to me, thinking about the mortality of someone with an overdose needs to be rapid. And that means now, not pizza next week. That needs to be treatment now on demand when you are ready and when it should be available. And that's what I think about as an emergency physician. This is a treatable life-threatening life disorder and we need to provide rapid access to evidence-based treatment. And for me, that means medications. As you heard Dr. Trotsky, sir, mention, we have remarkably, shockingly effective medications particularly for opioid use disorder that are highly effective in managing people's symptoms, keeping them into recovery and saving lives. And this is, you've all seen this, the ever climbing overdose death rate. And I think to some extent we've gotten numb to this, that overdose deaths continue to climb. However, every one of those deaths is preventable because we have such highly effective medications. And so really, when you look at the overdose death rate, to me, that is just emblematic of our failure to design a system that works for people. And so all of those deaths are on us because we have not created a system that meets people where they are. This is the statistic you heard, 10.3% of people age 12 and older who need treatment for substance use disorder received any treatment in the past year. This is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. That means around 90% of people are not receiving treatment. That means we need nine times the number of treatment options out there. So we cannot get there by tweaking at the edges. We need to radically expand treatment opportunities. Even less than those people who receive treatment actually receive life-threatening medications. 
The other piece that you heard, and I 100% agree with Dr. Sai on this, is there's a myth of treatment resistance. So in the survey, they often say 90% of the people, the 95% who say they don't need treatment. That has not been my experience. In the emergency department, I will show you some of the data from the California Bridge Program. We looked through and did our data dive, 85.8% .8 of the people we offered treatment to accepted it. So people want help. They're just not able to access the system as we have designed it. We have designed it to make it hard to access and we're excluding the people who need it most. This is drug medical, and this is basically the growth in drug medical from 2017 to 2021. This is the number of unduplicated clients served during that time period. And we're just not getting there. We are just not getting to that 90%. We really need to make a huge investment in our system to make MAT in particular available everywhere. This is the number of um, emergency department visits. So this is, this is my own possibility of people that we should reach. 1.2, uh, almost 1.3 million unduplicated emergency departments with an untreated substance use disorder in 2021. And if you think about this, substance use disorder is a huge driver of ED visits and a huge driver of harms in our community. If you think about motor vehicle collisions, substance use disorder is a driver. Suicide, one of the primary risk factors for suicide is an untreated substance use disorder. Firearm violence, interpersonal violence, heart failure, liver failure, all of these are driven by unmet needs for substance use treatment disorders. And so thinking about what is really the driver of a lot of illness and trauma in our society? It is our inability to meet the needs of our patient population in terms of substance use disorder treatment. And then the current system is really designed to fail, right? So we have long waits, prior authorization, complex assessment, you know this, disjointed siloed care, and then really restrictive paternalistic treatment models. As we've mentioned, insisting on abstinence before you're able to access treatment. This is like saying to the diabetic, I need you to sign a contract saying you'll never eat another donut again before I give you insulin. Who's gonna do that, right? Um, and so thinking about like, how can we design a system that works for people that meets them where they are and recognizes substance use disorder as the chronic illness that it is. This is from our, this is a, an evaluation that UCLA did of the SOR pro, uh, projects, the um, state opioid response funding. And you can't see it because the writing is so well, but you'll see that bar on the left are the number of people who were engaged in MAT through our emergency departments. And the next one is the number of people who are engaged in treatment through the hub and spoke system. And so you can see, even in our emergency departments, this is just by going up and asking people if they want help, we're able to engage almost three times as many people as the hub and spoke system. And it really just tells me there is a huge unmet need and people want help. We're just not delivering it to them in a way that they can access it. This is our California Bridge Program, 236 thousand people seen for substance use disorders, 176,000 people identified with opioid use disorder, and almost 80,000 prescriptions written for buprenorphine in the emergency department. We've distributed over 150,000 naloxone kits. Um, and I'm going to have you talk to Tommy Trevino next, but he is our amazing substance use navigator that has made this all happen in terms of bringing people into the system. Um, and the other thing I wanted to actually say about our California Bridge Program is this was not supposed to work, right? People in the emergency department, providers are too busy. Providers are not educated. They don't know how to give out buprenorphine or provide addiction treatment. These are emergency physicians they don't have time, um, they didn't have extra training, 
and this was when the X waiver was still in place and during the COVID pandemic. This was not supposed to work because you've been told that providers don't have time to do this. They don't want to do this. But over a couple years, we managed to get 270 emergency departments and countless emergency physicians to prescribe buprenorphine. People don't want help, but we have seen 85% of people that we just ask, do you want help? And 85% raise their hand and say, yes, today, I want help. And 170,000 of the, I'm sorry, almost 80,000 leave with buprenorphine that day, that minute. And so I think this puts to bed the myth of people don't want treatment and the myth that doctors can't do this because it can be done in the emergency department. And I really wanna talk about like, where do we go from here? How can we reimagine care for the people who need it and deliver care where they are? Because we've shown that can be effective when we deliver it where they are in the emergency department. And thinking about this is our California Bridge vision of the system of care, which really thinks about where patients are and how we can bring this system to work for the patient um, and to reach them where they are, be it the hospital, be it our criminal justice system, where they are in the community, but to provide that low barrier, low threshold, walk-in access point where it does not matter what county you're from if you have your Medi-Cal card or your ID. Um, and to make a system that works for people with substance use navigators that can help fill in those gaps. And so what we would propose would be low, a network of low threshold clinics across California that would help bring people in the system, stabilize them, and so that they can go on to addiction care, but that we can meet that high volume need across the state create an actual hub, which is where people can come in, access low threshold treatment, and then as they're stabilized, go back to primary care, the drug medical system if that's where they want to go, but receive on demand, low threshold access to treatment when they want it and make the system that works for people. I, I wanted to leave you with a story because I heard the talk about um, prevention. And for me, prevention is early intervention. And I think about this kind of like the early psychosis clinics. Um, back in 2020, we had a patient, Javier, he was 14, which is the same age as my daughter was that year. He came into the emergency department after overdosing four times. And each time we put him on a hold, um, said it must be a suicide attempt, 5150, eventually it was released and he went back home, overdosed, came back. And I sat there April, 2020 with his mother. And remember, I'm an addiction doctor. And she turned to me and she said, isn't there something we can give him to make him stop overdosing? And I, I still remember that moment of like, oh, I missed this. Um, he had been ordering fentanyl, the blue M30 Percocets online through Instagram, having them delivered to the house, overdosing, and his mother would reverse him on Narcan, and bring him in the emergency department. We started him on buprenorphine in that ED visit and then connected him to outpatient care. It didn't go well. Um, he went to our outpatient clinic, was eventually signed up through the county and assigned to the drug medical clinic, which is a methadone clinic. His mother called me a couple months later and said, there's no worse place for a 15, 14 year old kid to receive care than a methadone clinic. She says, this is just not gonna work for us. I hear you. So um, I did telehealth visits with him for a couple months. We got his medic house switched. We finally found a family practice provider who would provide him buprenorphine. I did not hear from them for a couple years. And then I heard from her, she called me um, three years later, just a couple months ago. He was missing his appointments because he'd made the high school basketball team and he couldn't go after school. 
And so um, I started doing more telehealth visits with him to make sure that he could continue on his buprenorphine. But it just kind of shows that to me is prevention because I think about the different direction that your life takes if you finish high school on the basketball team versus if we don't catch you until you're 26, if you make it that far. Um, and so I wanna leave you again with this, all people, and you have a tremendous opportunity to expand the treatment network in the state of California. It is currently not working. Um, and so what I would propose to you would be a network of low threshold clinics across California. The state has made a lot of payment reform with Medi-Cal. There are a lot of new features with CalAIM that I think could ultimately support low threshold clinics through the Medi-Cal system, but we really need to grow that network rapidly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mullen. And um, our last panelist is uh, Tommy Trevino. Tommy Trevino is a certified drug and alcohol counselor who specializes in drug use with co-occurring mental health. He has 20 years in recovery and is dedicated to the service of parents with loved ones that struggle with addiction. Uh, he's a substance use navigator at UC Davis and serves as a mentor to other substance use navigators around uh, and across California. And uh, I met Tommy a couple of years ago. I think we were here in LA. And uh, uh, since then, when I heard about him and know about him as he's a whatever it takes kind of, kind of person. And so I'm happy to have you hear from him, Tommy. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me here. Um, my name is Tommy Trevino, I'm 65 years old. Um, I started using uh, drugs without, when I was in seventh grade. I you know somebody over here said they worked with uh, with um, high school students or students. And, and that, that reminded me back when I first started when you said that. And it reminded me that even then I, did, I did, couldn't reach out for help. Even then I was, my parents and everybody else marked me as a drug addict at that age and put me in a place mentally where that's all I was gonna be. So anyway, long story short, I, I went through school and, and uh, chipped on smoked marijuana on and off. Uh, started drinking in high school, graduated high school, uh, got into cocaine, got married, um, that kind of thing. Got real heavy into drugs, uh, cocaine, acid, different things like that, kept drinking. Long story short, my wife finally had enough of me at the age of 35, divorced me, and then I moved from Fresno area to Sacramento. I stopped using for two years. I look back now, didn't have any support, but I stopped, you know, I wanted to get my life together. Uh, I stayed sober two years, and those two years, I was sharing with Tom, I worked so hard, drove truck, got a teamster job, invested all my money in the real estate, and I had 10 rentals. And somebody introduced me into meth, smoking meth. Two years later, I found myself walking in the snow in Medford, Oregon. 130 pounds, I weigh a little more than that now, but um, goes to show you. And I just like woke up and go, well, what the heck's going on here? And, uh, and I looked at myself and I go, man, this isn't me. This isn't me. How am I going to get out of here? But, you know, I ended up homeless, like, like what you shared earlier. It was just like, you know, what am I going to do? So I, I'm a very proud man. And I humbled myself to uh, stop using drugs. I was going to stop. But every time I stopped, I would last like a week. And then I'd find myself either getting depressed or getting mad, getting angry, getting anxiety. And then I would run to the meth pipe and take a hit. And then I would feel normal. And that's when it finally hit me. You're a drug addict, right? So I didn't know where to turn to. So I went to the library there in Medford and started reading the first book. It was, it was, I was just out of luck. I started reading what I had to get through to get better. And, I, and it talked about emotions that I was going to go through the depression, anxiety, and anger for a year. Now, I'm not a doctor or anything, but that stood out to me. And I go, man, it makes sense. Every time I use, every time I try to stay, get straight, I get angry or mad and I use it and I feel normal. It made sense to me, but now it's self-medicating, right? So um, I came back to Sacramento and I told a friend of mine that worked for the state, uh, my plan, she goes, I have to, I need a place to stay for a year. She goes, you can stay in my garage, but for trade, you have to remodel my house. I said, okay, that's a deal. And I told her, so 
uh, whenever I would get in that depressed mood, she would go in the garage, Tommy, get up, come on, get up, take a shower, get something to eat. And whenever I get mad and angry, man, I'm leaving, I'm going to go get loaded. Tommy, remember, she helped me. She helped me. She motivated me and kept me there. Ten months went by, and I remember waking up one morning, and it was like someone turned the light on. It was like I looked around, and I felt this big shame come over me. And it was like looking over and looking back and going, what the heck was that? That, that breaking point when I read, I finally got there and it was like, what am I going to do now? So I joined a church and I um, worked at a thrift store for $8 an hour. It was, I remember getting my first check, $400, man. I was just so happy to get that check. And, and uh, they had a job coach there and they talked to me and they wanted to know my life story. And I told them, they go, hey, you know, we, we support people and go into school. So they helped me become a drug counselor. They asked me if I wanted to do that. I didn't know if I can do it, but I went and visited a couple of schools and I go, man, I can do this. So it was a do and die for me. I was already 40 something years old. I, I have to do this. I put it in my mind. I have to do this or I'm, I don't want to end up homeless again. This is, this is the do or die thing for me. And I put everything I had in it. Um, I went to school. Uh, they paid for my internship. I worked at a, a community uh, clinic in West Sacramento called Community Care. And uh, I worked there for a year, got my 2,030 hours, pa took the state test, passed it by one point. I was so happy. I was just like, man, you know, so uh, I got a job at a DUI um, program, started working with people with DUIs. And then people with mental health started coming in. And uh, I remember getting $17 an hour by then. And then I go, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? I can't help these people with mental health, right? So it's just, it's just all a waste. What am I doing here? You know, I knew about drug addiction. So... I took a job for Wellspace Health at $13 an hour working with people with mental health. I didn't have time to go to college and learn all this stuff. I had to do this now. Like Tom says, I had to do this now. So I had 50 patients and my job was to make sure they took the medications and uh, get them to the clinic and get them, get them where they needed to go. If my job wasn't to get them to stop using drugs, I would go in their apartment and go, hang on, Tom. They would go ahead and shoot up some heroin or go ahead and smoke some weed. And I, okay, you ready? Let's go as long as you weren't violent or anything. So um, I did that for about three years and I loved it. I loved it. I learned so much about mental health. I knew when someone was taking too much medication, I go, let's check your medication Monday through Friday. Today's Monday, why is Wednesday missing? And there was, they were seeing little possums in their, in their room, right? Oh, okay, I get it, you're over medicated. So I learned so much. Somehow Dr. Mullen found me and uh, asked me if I, she goes, I have a, People that keep coming to the emergency room with drug addiction, we don't know what to do. We need some help. And I'm thinking, me, you know, I, go, I don't know. So I, go, so I went down there to see her, and I go, this is a crazy place. I, I've never been in a hospital before, but people in the hallways, uh, people in gurneys, doctors, and UC Davis is huge. And uh, I go, what do you want me to do? She goes, you're the professional. You tell me. And I'm just like, man, I don't know. So I looked over, and I seen this gentleman. He was intoxicated. So I grabbed a small chair, and I go, can I sit down next to you? Yeah, we're sitting and we're watching everything. Oh man, this place is off the hook, right? So anyway, I ended up talking to him for about two hours. We're like, he was a grandfather, he was divorced, and he had a good job, and he had a retirement check, but he was an alcoholic. And this is where community resources are so important. I knew enough people in the community to find treatment for him. Got him to treatment, and everybody thought I was a genius. I go, is that all I have to do? And I can do this, right? <laughs> so, uh, Every, every day I should wake up in the morning, I go, man, Lord, just let me help somebody today. Just let me help somebody today. And I love meth addicts because I'm a recovering meth addict. And when I would talk to somebody, I knew what they're going through. I knew what they were going through. And then half the people that were struggling with mental health, I knew them. It was like, Leroy, you go, Tommy, what are you doing here? I said, I work here now. with one of my patients, right? Like my clients. So I was well involved with my community and it's pretty tight. Um, I got to learn that, uh, so many things in the hospital, like Dr. Mullen. When I first started working there, we treat addicts bad. They were like, get this drunk out of here, get this alcoholic out of here. And I go, hey, don't you treat them people like that? And uh, and sometimes they got in an argument and they would call Dr. Mullen, you know, Tommy's mad again. And she would stick back me up. What'd you do to him? You know, it was just like uh, nothing. He wants, he wants medication. Well, give it to him, give him what he wants. And it was just like, she always supported me in this. Now, it's grown so big that I have five counselors working for me. I'm a supervisor and I still can't keep up. Uh, my youngest was 12 years old. Um, we have an adolescent program now that we help out. Uh, I've hired a, a veteran, VA, to help out the veterans. So I hired a mother that uh, her daughter was alcoholic. So I have trying to get a round team in the hospital. And I feel so blessed to be able to do this. 
what some of my bears are insurances. Most of our patients are Medi-Cal, right? So it's like, there's different programs. Some programs, Christian-based programs work well. They want you to stay a year, but you can't be on medication. You have to be 45 years old or younger. And you have to stay a year because they know it takes that year for your brain to kind of switch around and your dopamines to get what they're supposed to go. They know that, but a lot of people don't like Christian-based programs. You know, they don't believe in God or Jesus, whatever. And I tell them, just go for a year. Just go, get your life. This is your chance. A lot of people go and a lot of them do really well, really well, get their lives back. But other programs that I find, they're only in Sacramento County. If I start trying to send someone to Fresno or the Bay Area, they accuse me of patient dumping. I have to be careful. And I've learned different ways, different tricks, but I have to be really careful and use the resources in my community. Uh, some resources, you have to be high to go. Some resources, you have to have four days to go before they help you. Other, other, other programs, you need an ID. It's like, who's gonna have an ID? And I think about when I was homeless and stuff. And, and, um, and, and when I humbled myself to get some clothes to go get that job and I asked for a cement job, I remember looking back, it was like, this is my chance. I humbled myself to get these clothes. And I thought I had the job, the guy interviewed me. And at the very end, he goes, no, he goes, I can't, I can't do it. And man, I just, I go, why? He goes, can I give you some advice? Next time you go on an interview, can you get some better clothes on? And it just put me in a place where it was just like, man, I was trapped, I was, you know? So I dedicated my life and taking this opportunity that Dr. Mullen gave me to help anybody I can. Like Tom says, there is no such thing as no to me. If somebody wants help, I know enough people now where I can get them in a program. I make agreements with clinics. I know they have funding MAP programs and I know they have to have people. And so we're a better place to get them from the hospital, right? To get, get people. So, and I need a place, we need a place for these people to go to. So we set them up, we have different programs, different agreements, we give them three week uh, prescription. That takes a while for insurances to switch. It all depends like well space health is one medical insurance. Another clinic can be a different one. If one, if one clinic is offering certain services and the other one doesn't, but this patient needs that, say this woman is pregnant and she needs this, she needs this for her and her baby. I have to make sure that insurance gets switched. There's barriers. I, my goal is to one day hopefully have a place where all these programs are like in one building where you can go like, no, you don't qualify here because you're loaded. So go over there. Or no, you're straight and you go over here. It's hard, to, it's hard to go somewhere. It's hard. You just don't know where to go. If there was just one place where an addict can just go there while you're still fogged up and, and, and you know, Nobody wants to be a drug addict. Nobody, nobody wants to be there. But somehow we ended up there. I have a disease and I, I wasn't born with it, but I know I'm gonna die with it and I wanna have it for the rest of my life. And I struggle with, I've learned that I struggle with depression, anxiety, and anger. And that's mental health. That's probably why I was using all this time. I went to a therapist and I asked him, did I screw myself up with these drugs or was I born like that? He goes, Tommy, it doesn't matter. Who are you today? Who are you today? I'm someone that spent 30 years of my life using drugs and I, want, and I have the last 20 years helping people get off of drugs and I'm gonna continue doing that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tommy. Um, uh, Cheryl, uh, pass it back to you and I think we have time for some questions and discussion now before we break for lunch. Yes, thank you. Well, first, um, I want to thank all the panelists for sharing your knowledge, expertise, and just the, the wealth of information. Um, so I do, I want to just bring it back to uh, fellow commissioners for questions, comments. Uh, please, Commissioner Bunch. I, again, I want to I wanna thank everyone. I learned so much mm -hmm. today, and I'm actually embarrassed that I didn't know a lot of it, given that I'm in this field. Um, I love this idea of meeting people where you're at or where they're at, and we hear it all the time in therapy, but I don't feel like clinicians think about it in terms of substance abuse. And I know personally, just from a, a recent experience with a family member who's uh, in the past couple of weeks is going through substance abuse issues, and I was like, well, no, you have to stop everything. And I, I just, how little I know is appalling. Um, one of the questions I had for you, Dr. Sai, is your first slide, you had something about mental health and substance abuse not being under the same system. Can you clarify that? Yeah, I was just talking about the Medi-Cal system. Because um, in California, it's, it, you've probably heard the term kind of carved out 
and that, that just refers to the fact that there's drug medical separate from especially mental health separate from kind of fee-for-service medical over physical health so that do you think that means that mental health is treating substance substance abuse in a really different way than like you guys are no so um there is some substance use treatment happening in especially mental health systems but not as much as i think um I've had conversations, for example, with our sister department about expanding their SUD capabilities within the special mental health system. Um, but because of the carve-out system, and essentially it's the drug medical system focused on substance use treatment, the special mental health system focused on mental health treatment. I think that there are opportunities, for example, under CalAIM with the Behavioral Health Administrative Integration to try to achieve more on-the-ground care integration, um, behavioral health care integration, where you know clients who have co-occurring mental health and substance use, which are a lot of clients right, that, that we serve, um, can uh, materially access all of the needed services at once versus being told to sequentially access services, which mm -hmm. is kind of the um, suboptimal and traditional way in which uh, people with co-occurring conditions are approached. I can give an example of that. Um, so if you are in my emergency department and you are on buprenorphine and you are also suicidal and need to go to or meet criteria for an inpatient hospitalization, you can either go to the inpatient hospitalization or continue buprenorphine because they won't continue the buprenorphine at the inpatient psych hospital because I'm not sure, but they often feel like they're not licensed to continue an opioid treatment. And so this, this happens over and over where I have to, a lot of patients will, we will treat them in the emergency department because going to that hospital means you have to stop your medications. I can also add with um, people experiencing schizophrenia or active psychosis, they're often told by the mental health community that they have to stop using stimulants like cocaine or like methamphetamines before starting antipsychotics. And it's been a real challenge to just say, you need to start antipsychotics now. It will help both of these issues. I'm not sure if your psychosis is due to your, you know, stimulant use pattern or because you have other mental health issues. But either way, we need to start treatment now and and follow use, you know, over time. So it's very rare and hard to find somebody who feels confident in saying that message, even though that's we, the standard of care. We want to have a firm diagnosis of like, do you have organic psychosis or is this a stimulant induced psychosis? And the person who's experiencing it, I mean, they don't care, right? Like they just want help. And we have this siloed system of like, oh, if you have organic psychosis, you go over here. If you have meth induced psychosis, you go over here. But that person, like they really just want help and they are not in a place to sort out all of this. And so our system really is designed to push people out. Thank you. I see a comment. Um, Commissioner Robinson online, please. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, fascinating presentation. Uh, learned a lot uh, today. Really proud of what uh, California is doing. And as someone who practiced many years ago, uh, it's, it's uh, great to see where the science is taking us. I, I would just love to hear some comments about um, what we're doing to drive access for communities of color, uh, marginalized groups, and particularly maybe even tailored comments a little bit around how we're uh, providing access to older Americans that we know are starting to use uh, medications at a higher um, uh, rate than, than previously. So, so love to hear more about what we're doing to improve access to uh, marginalized communities. One of the things that help us in that way is employing people like Tommy. So we um, work with peer educators who have lived experience who can really broker that cultural knowledge and that community capital and um, ensure that they're speaking correct language, um, making the right connections with people so that um, the credible messenger is that person who's in the community and I'm supporting them in designing a health plan that works for them. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, in terms of older Americans, 
my bias, you know, I work in hospitals, so I often see my patients are, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s with end organ damage, usually because of their substance use disorder. So recognizing that, yes, you have heart failure, you have kidney failure, you have liver failure, and also you have substance use disorder, and we can treat all of these in this place and in this time. Um, that's how our, our strategy has been. I'm sure there's lots of other good strategies, too. Yeah. Go ahead. I can... Um, so... Uh, part of the work that we do is around uh, media campaigns, um, for example, methamphetamine, the opioid crisis, fentanyl, um, we just released recently. Um, and so for those campaigns, we're, we are very strategic in terms of where um, those billboards, radio ads, um, social media messaging, how we're messaging to specific target audiences. The other thing I would lift up is similar to what Dr. Trotsky had mentioned in terms of workforce. Um, we have a tuition incentive program pilot where, um, uh, sorry, it's no longer a pilot, um, where we provide financial assistance to people who are interested in becoming substance use counselors but don't have the financial means in order to pursue the coursework necessary to go through the, regis the, the registration and certification process. And part of that tuition incentive award um, does consider uh, the backgrounds of, of individuals awarded to ensure the workforce that we are um, facilitating matches the clients that they're serving. And this is... I actually just wanted to highlight that question because all of the work, particularly for substance use, needs to be grounded in equity. And we have not talked about the history of stigma criminalization, particularly for our communities of color. And that underlies the entire treatment system that we have for substance use disorders. So I just wanted to say and to recognize we have a long history of providing different, highly stigmatized care, some of it just the criminal justice system for people of color. And then if you look at where we're providing treatment, either even today, and you look at difference in treatment access by zip code, primarily in lower income communities of color, that is where you will find methadone clinics you will find buprenorphine access in higher income zip codes. And so today there's a disparity in terms of where we locate um, clinics and treatment access, but also we can't move forward until we recognize that longstanding history of criminalization and stigmatization in terms of how we address substance use disorders. So appreciate the question. Thank you. This is uh, Tyler's. My job is to find a place for somebody. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're 12 years old or my oldest patient was 80 something years old. She didn't even speak English. She was from uh, from uh, Vietnam. She got addicted to op op opium up there and we got her on buprenorphine. But there isn't there isn't any places. There isn't any inpatient, especially if you're starting with, with uh, medical issues, no one's gonna take you. Rehabs are set up for people that are gonna get their lives back like myself, get back in the workforce and stuff. If you got some, medical issues, that's primary. And then your, your addiction would be secondary. But that's where we come in and motivate the patient. Even now, people like myself that I know that are still alive are now having medical issues and are going into in-home in support services on methadone. But you have to go to the methadone clinic every morning to get your dose. But there's laws, there's state laws where you can't prescribe it like you can buprenorphine, right? So that's a big problem. But it's complicated, addiction is complicated, and, and there's a lot to it. I've learned so much, and we've got the families to deal with. We've got the mothers, the grandmothers to deal with. They don't know what to do. It just goes on and on and on and on. But that's why it's so important to have programs and know your programs and not be able to send someone of color to another uh, place in town where he's not gonna feel comfortable to put that person in a place where he's gonna feel comfortable, right? If, if, there, if such a place exists, usually with someone has medical issues and is getting older like myself uh, and is an addict, you, you're gonna develop a lot of mental health issues. You stay homeless long enough, you're gonna develop mental health issues and physical issues, guarantee you. There's gonna be something going on. Thank you, Tommy. Um, I see Commissioner Brown. Um, let me just ask Commissioner Gordon. Commissioner Gordon, I don't know if you had your hand up and if not, then I'm gonna go ahead and, and move on, sir. Okay. Oh, no, move on, so, please. Commissioner Brown, please, and then, yes, he did. Commissioner Brown, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. I uh, First of all, I want to thank all of you. You did an outstanding job. You're a great panel. I think you should take this show on the road. There's a lot of people that need to hear the message that you have. 
lots of uh, people both in and out of the system, uh, those who control the purse strings for a lot of a lot of things. I salute your positive attitude and your obvious passion for what it is that you are all doing. So thank you for that. And uh, I know at times it's got to be very overwhelming. You know, the LA County um, scope of need, the, uh, the, the UC Davis, uh, all of it is, you, you know, you're dealing, you're at the point of the spear. You're dealing with very, very significant numbers of people who have substance use disorder and uh, many times co-occurring mental illness. And that's a it's a tough field. It's a tough job. And I uh, really, really appreciate all that you do. You said some very profound things today between you. Uh, things like, uh, you know, we're getting numb. People are getting numb to the number of people that are dying of, of uh, overdose. As you so rightly pointed out, preventative deaths. Um, some have pointed out that, you know, if you equated the number of people that die to the number of people on an airplane, it's like we're having an airplane crash every day. And if we really had an airplane crash in every day, there'd be task forces mobilized, aviation experts, everybody would be, you know, thoroughly behind this effort. But there's just too much of an attitude, I think, that, oh, this is, doesn't affect me or doesn't affect my family or this isn't in my sphere. And uh, it's, it's terribly sad, but, you know, it's just one of those things. Those people are using drugs or those people are, uh, are mentally ill. And the reality is there is, I think, as you point out, so many things that can be done to save lives and to revitalize lives if, if the people receive the proper treatment. And I think that you've hit the nail right on the head. To do that, you have to take the care to where it's needed. You have to go meet people who are, by nature, perhaps resistant to service, but not completely unreachable. And to do that, you have to go onto the streets, you have to go into the bridges, you have to go, you know, into the field, you have to work at night, you have to work on weekends. And one of the biggest problems that I think I see is that our traditional systems, both in mental health and in substance use treatment, are all based on Monday through Friday, eight to five kinds of jobs. And they're based on giving people, you know, appointments to come and go uh, get treatment. And as you, um, Dr. Mullen, you know, so rightly pointed out, these are people that don't have for the, you know, they don't have transportation, they don't have cell phones, they don't have a whole lot of uh, experience of, with responsibility in many cases, and, and it's very difficult. But my question, I guess, to you is, how do we recruit, where do you think the, the people are? We got, we, we the system, uh, and, and, you know, law, I, I would say law enforcement as well as, as the, the, the physical and mental health services have to throw our recruitment nets in different ponds because we're not, we're not getting the people that are, are, are wanting to work those weekends and nights and holidays and, uh, and, and everything else. Do you have any thoughts or ideas on how we should change our, our effort to try to you know, get people to seek this line of work and, uh, you know, uh, and, and to continue in it. Yeah, I can start off and I, I think others will have thoughts too. Um, workforce is a really, really big challenge right now across the board. Um, I think that the uh, recent peer specialist uh, benefit um, through Medi-Cal is one option for us to sustainably fund um, a workforce with lived experience who um, uh, hopefully will be more open to provide the varied services that I think many of us have talked about um, as, as needing to better address needs in the community. Um, you know, I also think that having kind of creative ways to support uh, workforce recruitment um, whether it's through, uh, you know, cost sharing, I mentioned, tuition incentives, uh, you know, bonuses. I know that, that a lot of um, counties are offering those in order to try to increase um, recruitment numbers with some uh, positive uh, outcomes. Um, you know, I, I think that there's always going to be um, a workforce shortage, but an another approach that we perhaps haven't talked so much about but isn't immediately um, uh, available is really looking upstream to um, engaging our future workforce. Um, I mean, I, I think that that's something that um, we can be sowing some seeds um, to, to 
uh, really get us where we need to be in the future. Um, I also think there's a lot of room for us to work with our current workforce now, our current physicians, our current nurses, social workers, to get them um, practicing with more integrated mindsets. Um, I think that there's a, the default right now is for people to think, okay, that's a substance use issue, let's refer them somewhere. And I think that that's something that we as a system, um, if we're ever gonna achieve behavioral health integration, will need to break. I, uh, I, know, I keep going back to where, where I work with the mental health. I had 50 patients and, and I'd make sure, and when Dr. Moulin, I'll never forget that she told me, we don't know what to do that people keep coming back. And my mind is, I'm gonna do whatever I can to keep them out of the hospital, whatever I can. I think that first year, 80% of the people I've seen didn't come back. It wasn't because they all got sober and clean. Some of them did, but they didn't know where to go. And I would take my time, one person at a time, to make sure they got the help they wanted to get to. So my next idea, and I've been sharing with Dr. Mullen, was that peer navigators are now coming up. I don't know if you heard of them. People with uh, live experience like myself, people that doesn't, they don't care if it's Saturday or Sunday, they'll, they'll work. They, they wanna give back. They're not afraid of walking up, seeing a needle on the ground. They're not afraid of seeing somebody OD. We've been there, we've seen that. I see sharing with Dr. Mullen, before this Narcan, when I, I seen somebody OD when I, when I was younger, I didn't know what to do, I knew they died, so I just hit them in the chest. Came back to life, another guy had to kick him to wake him up. But it was just like, someone that's not afraid to go out there. I've been to camps, I go to camps, I go out there. When I'm feeling bad and I'm feeling like, like I'm not doing a whole lot, I go and visit there. That's where I feel more comfortable. So that's one avenue, that's one. For that 20% that can't keep coming back, they need that help. They're not mentally there. They can't, you can give them a resource, they're just gonna like, you know, drop in and just keep walking. They won't even make it to the, to the uh, pharmacy to get their medications. They need that extra help. And I think peer navigators, um, they don't make a whole lot of money, but they're not in it to make a whole lot of money. They're in it to give back and help. I, I would say we love peer navigators. Um, peer navigators are siloed off. Again, you have to be a specialty mental health or a specialty drug treatment in order to access peer navigators. Uh, there are some new benefits around like community health workers where you can bring someone with that type of experience into a primary care clinic. But if we're going to get there to the point where people have access to treatment, it has to be integrated into all aspects of care. And I just don't accept the fact that it can't happen because I've seen emergency physicians prescribing buprenorphine. So when we hear, oh, primary care can't do it, I think we just have not yet given them the tools and the resources to do it because I saw that adoption in emergency departments during the COVID-19 pandemic. And in terms of like, where do you cast your net to find patients? The emergency department, the criminal justice system and the streets. It's not, I mean, we know where the patients are. We just need to go and provide treatment there in the emergency department, criminal justice system, unfortunately, and the streets. And so this is our thought is, I know where the people are. I know how to get them treatment. And so it, part of it is that it just kills me that we're not doing it. Thinking about um, like EMS services and fire departments and police that are available 24 seven in addition to the emergency rooms so, you know, our EMS in some of our counties are leaving behind naloxone, starting buprenorphine, because they're seeing those people overdose at two in the morning, and then who are afraid to go to the emergency room. When we can address people in the emergency room, that's great. There's a large number of people that don't even make it that far, and if we can empower those helping professionals who are already up and awake and involved in our communities 24-7, those are the people that need the support in the real time, whether it's a phone a friend availability or some standing orders or some other kinds of ways to give them the tools to start treatment in that moment. So, <clears throat> so what I'm hearing is, is, you know, the continued siloing, you know, we really need to integrate the primary health, the mental health and the SDG. So if there's a way to do it, why aren't we doing it? And we had, um, we had Kylo on the call and I don't see him, so I would love to ask this way. Um, Let's get there. So um, at this time, though, I, I do want to follow. We have um, Dave Gordon, and then I see um, 
Commissioner Ganovich and then Commissioner Mitchell and then Commissioner Carnevale uh, to make statements. So um, let me start with uh, Commissioner Gordon, please, online, if you could. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I want to thank the uh, the panel. It was an excellent set of uh, set of presentations. And and to Dr. Mullen's point, uh, I, I work in the school system as a as a superintendent, and we're trying the navigator system with some of the uh, SB HIP reforms, which uh, have been uh, uh, very very promising. And uh, I I will say to you that uh, I struggled with a substance abuse disorder, and if not for my family being able to navigate the system in the ways that Dr. Molan has, has spoken about, I, I would not be alive today. Trust me, I would not, I would not be alive. But that's what every person in the situation I was in really needs. And the system just has got to change and, and look at someone like Dr. Molan should have the authority to call upon a trained navigator with lived experience because the first two or three things that someone wants to try to help you may not work. But if you're out there just on your own, coming to from appointment to appointment to appointment, you're not going to make it. You're, you're not going to survive all of that. You have to have an advocate or, or a navigator or somebody to work with you. So, so I would say as we move forward with, uh, with trying to make the system more accessible and more helpful to uh, to the, uh, the the people we've talked about today. Uh, let's let's think outside the box and let's not be caught up in the in the system the way it is. It needs to be different. So so thank you and thank you uh, presenters and thank you. Your work is is heroic. Thank you, Commissioner G Gordon. Commissioner Ganovich, please. Yeah, so my question was going to be directed to Tyler Sadwick. If he's not on, perhaps I'll direct it to, to Gary Tsai. Um, and it relates to the a stakeholder that we don't have represented. And first, I would echo um, Commissioner Brown's just commendation for what an outstanding panel this is and the roadshow idea. Um, I think I, I live in this space and I'm still moved uh, to hear how incredibly each of you articulate um, the, the, the urgency and the importance and the impact. Um, uh, Dr. Mullen, in the example that you gave of the person that you took care of, right, you initiated them in, in, into care and then you couldn't connect them into care and you had to go beyond your role as an emergency physician to manage somebody on an ambulatory basis. And I think that speaks to who is not around the panel list, which is the, the programs, the specialty substance use disorder programs who are supposed to be able and ready to accept people who've been started on treatment and continue that treatment and manage things that come <coughs> together with treatment like PTSD or like a certain level of psychotic disorders or depression that are so comorbid. And, and that's a part of the system that has a lot of <coughs> the ingredients that are necessary to deliver improved care. And now, you know, Tyler Sadwick spoke about standards that the state has adopted and requirements for what it means to deliver each of those care. And yet the way things work in our system, <coughs> money from the state flow down to the counties. You know, um, Dr. Tsai's group subcontracts with providers and then has to try to support the, the program's ability to actually meet standards of care that require them to address these conditions in an integrated way. The question is, how do we help? I mean, until we help those programs provide better care, we're going to continue to have people cycling through the system, getting initiated over and over again and falling through cracks. How do we support that system to be able to provide higher levels of care consistent with the standards, to leverage all these new funding streams that are supposed to incentivize more holistic and integrated care and help us get out of the cycle? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, you know, I think that what we had talked about earlier in terms of the split of um, <coughs> funding in Medi-Cal for special mental health versus drug Medi-Cal is significant because it highlights 
why a lot of agencies are struggling with some of the more state-of-the-art standards that are being set now, for example, through the American Society of Addiction Medicine, where MAT is elevated, medications for addiction treatment are elevated more. Um, even currently, um, there are regulations in residential substance use settings that consider them non-medical, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's something I've, I've spoken with Tyler about, and I know that there's interest in kind of uh, figuring out how we can ensure that um, all health facilities, including residential substance use facilities, are considered um, medical um, so that we can offer things like MAT more readily. Um, and so I think that one of the most important things um, is that we invest in the special SUD system to be able to meet the expectations that we're all setting for them. Um, you know, I, I think that whenever there's been funding opportunities, for example, Prop 64, right? Um, the investment on, on the specialty systems has, has oftentimes been overlooked. And I, I understand um, the frustrations, for example, with Dr. Mullen and trying to refer in specialty systems and having challenges. And to me, the answer isn't, let's figure out how to bypass that. The answer is, let's figure out how we invest in that to strengthen the system. Uh, because the reality is that, you know, from where I sit, um, we will not achieve uh, on the ground behavioral health care integration unless we invest in the SUD system because the SUD system is an essential arm of behavioral health. Otherwise, we're just talking about mental health. And I'm a psychiatrist, so I, you know, I value mental health. But um, you know, having worked on the special SUD side, the dearth of resources, the dearth of attention, um, the lack of focus on priorities around substance use, um, I see that every day. And that's one of the reasons why I appreciate this commission uh, focusing time and energy on this topic because um, you know, we're in an emergency situation and, and we need to be acting as such. And so I think that investing resources in the especially SUD system to get it up to where it needs to be. Workforce is something that we have to always be focused on in terms of you know, training standards. There have been recent e efforts to elevate SUD counselor training standards. SUD counselors represent 80% plus of the workforce in the special SUD system in LA. I think that is reflective of other um, counties as well. Um, and, uh, and I think I've talked to some of the commissioners yesterday about this. When we talk about behavioral health workforce, um, in the past, a lot of behavioral health workforce initiatives were focused on licensed clinicians. And while that's needed, um, that bypasses, as I mentioned, 80% of the workforce of special SUD systems. And so um, that's just something that we have to keep in mind. I know that more recently, HCI has made some progress in focusing behavioral health workforce initiatives that include SUD counselors. And I think that paying specific attention to that will be really, really important. I don't, there's, there's a lot to uh, that question, uh, Commissioner Denovich, and happy to talk more. I, I just want to say it's, it's a great question, and, and this is one of the things that makes me very frustrated, is that we continue to fund residential treatment facilities that don't incorporate medications. We know that, we know that medications work, and so why, as a state, do we continue to fund programs that don't insist on offering medications? To me, that would be like allowing there to be a treatment program for diabetes and hypertension that focused only on diet, but didn't offer someone insulin. It does not make sense that we continue to allow that to happen. And to the other point, the thing that from my perspective as an emergency physician, when we look at standards for clinics, what you then see is you only see the people who are already in that system. And you are looking at how well they're providing treatment to the people in the system, but entirely missing the bulk of the population that is outside of the system. So we need to think about both of those things. How do we do a better job of taking care of people in the system, but also how do we reach the people who are not there and make sure that they can get into the system? And so those are two things that are sometimes an intention with each other. And I just wanna make sure that we don't forget about the people that aren't even getting in the door. Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell and then Commissioner Carnevale. I think most of it's been said, but um, the presentation, oh, 
Uh, thank you. The presentation was absolutely beautiful. It restores my hope in, um, in this area. Um, there's so much stigma with SUD, and I think that's lots of the problem, uh, much of the problem. So, you know, to the sheriff's question regarding how do we deal with this workforce issue, I just think so much of it, and I just want to put it on the record, it just has to do with education and um, reducing the stigma. We've had reduction, you know, we've had stigma campaigns to reduce stigma. But a lot of it is, as Mr. Trevino said, it's just people caring, people who have been, um, you know, who have the lived experience and wanting to be on the ground, whether it's at midnight, whether it's at 2 a.m., whether it's whenever, they want to give back. So it's that workforce that's out there um, at Sylvia yesterday in the trenches, you know, not unafraid to go up to someone who looks horribly frightening and say, hey, what do you need? Have a conversation, see that person. That's the workforce that the net needs to be spread to because those are the people, Dr. Mouton, who are gonna bring those patients into the clinic. You know, the question, hey, do you need help? Are you gonna be here when I come back? Cause I have a bed, I know where you can go, but there's so much ignorance, fear, bias of the very people that we are employed to serve. And no one wants to talk about that bias. It's that quiet, I, you know, we talk about our clients, we talk about them. And so we, we must educate our workforce to why we do what we do and the history that comes with that practice. Because the history just didn't happen. We practice a certain way because those are some old practices that came to this country as we colonized it. And so those practices have not gone away. We just need to continue to educate and cast that net to those individuals who really care about people. And if you're on the high end of the spectrum in terms of income, that's great. There's tons of people at the bottom of the ladder who will do anything they can to bring that client in, whether it's two, three, four, five in the morning. So thank you for just mentioning the disparity, the um, methadone clinic in the hood versus the buprenorphine in um, Beverly Hills. Those are real disparities that no one really wants to address. So it comes down to education, educating this field. So th those are just my comments, thank I, you. I just wanna say, um, 100% agree with you. And I wanted to bring up the point of Tommy changed my entire hospital just by being there, by modeling that destigmatized and behavior, um, and by showing us all that substance use is treatable. And so we all learned, hey, there's something we can do. Um, and he changed not just the emergency department, but the whole hospital. And this is actually why California Bridge, the primary focus of California Bridge was to fund substance use navigators in emergency departments. We did training for the doctors, but the primary focus and my goal was to put a Tommy in every emergency department in the state of California. And I can't say enough about just having him there made all the difference in the world in how we practice and how we approach people. Um, and you're 100% right about the disparities in how we treat people. And I, this is a whole topic, and I apologize I'm going over town, but this is just something that I believe in so deeply, is if you take that history of criminalization and look at how we provide treatments, and a lot of times we have these paternalistic treatment models that bring that ethos of punishment and criminalization to our treatment space, 
that alienates people and, and, and exacerbates disparities in how people are treated and receive that treatment because of that treatment ethos that has its roots in criminalization. So I appreciate you for bringing it up and we could talk about it all day. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna go with Commissioner Carnevale, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but I'm agitated. I'm thinking of an old movie, I don't remember the name, where the guy sticks his head out the window and just says, I'm mad as hell and I can't take it anymore. I mean, how many times are we gonna listen to fricking broken systems that we're just living with. So we're sitting here and I, I'm gonna come to a specific recommendation, but I'm gonna rant and rave for a minute. I mean, we've got, we've got the Mental Health Commission here. We've got HHS here. We have a, had a Senate representative here. We've got, we, 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 we have all the government representatives here and we're treating this broken system like we're the victim and there's nothing we can do about it. If we can't do something about it, th then who is? How about if we commit to the buck stopping here and we figure out how to fix this system in this case, this one time? You know, I just think of, I, there were so many places that were broken yesterday, I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. I just remember one example, somebody said, you know, people get let out of incarceration and, and it takes them 30 to 60 days before they can get the paperwork to get their health care, I guess. Is like, in what planet does that make sense? Who made these rules? Who's decided this was a good idea? There's just no way that these, this decision makes sense from a people place, from a cost place, from a system place. It doesn't make sense. So I know I'm naive. I don't work in the system. There's a hundred reasons why it's built this way. But how about if we start dissecting it? So I, I'm the business guy here. And you know, I'm usually the guy who's thinking big picture and strategy, but I'm, I'm gonna pick up the other end of the stick here because to me, this is a real operational problem. I mean, Dr. Sai, I appreciate you growing the program through you know, innovative financing, which is great. And you said the right thing, which is we have to stop band-aiding this. So business solves this problem by reversing the whole thing. We have a system that's structured and we're pretending it's fixed. And then we're trying to, we're hiring navigators to help the clients, you know, work within our system. We do the opposite in business. We actually dissect the customer experiences and we change our systems to meet the customer. And we do it to sell them cheeseburgers and Christmas ornaments and lawnmowers. So, you know, maybe we might want to do it around something important like healthcare. So I'm going to suggest maybe this has already been done. If it's already been done, then great. Let's elevate it and do something about it. But if not, I would recommend, since we're in the business of innovation, one of the places we should spend our innovative dollars is let's go outside the healthcare system. Let's hire the people that do this for business. You go to the Stanford D School. You go to, to IDO. You go to people who do human-centered uh, uh, design centered thinking, and they will, they will architect the entire journey and identify all the places it's broken. And let's identify all the systems and the people and everybody that make these decisions. And let's figure out what we have to change to fix the system and let's go change it. I mean, it's, it's a simple concept. It's very hard to do, so but me, it works me, in business. Thank you, Commissioner Carnavale. Yeah. So we have Tyler back on online and Tyler, I hope you've been um, listening to um, what Commissioner Carnevale has said, and just we've had questions. No, knowing, you know, it seems that as it stands now, the system has essentially just been designed and to fail, and so everything's siloed from our primary health to mental health and, and SGD. And so, what is the plan for the state to really align so that we're able to address this effectively? And it's not so siloed, and we're not letting our citizens, you know, fall through the cracks. And so, if you could just share with us your thoughts around that. Sure, thank and thanks you. for coming back on, Tyler. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just want to confirm uh, you can hear me. We can. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, for the question. Um, 
Unfortunately, um, I think as the commission knows well with, with mental health, we have a fragmented uh, uh, service delivery system. And I think that is compounded uh, for substance use disorder in particular. Um, I think it's the result of, you know, sort of decades of uh, policy choices, uh, decades of underfunding, decades of neglect in research and the medical establishment in treating substance use disorder as a health a healthcare condition. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, across the country, you know, counties were sort of left with the responsibility for it. Um, and in the absence of science and uh, uh, medicine and sufficient reimbursement, um, providers have sort of cobbled together, you know, practices that that work for them, which uh, are often rooted in 12-step programs and mutual aid societies. So I think it's just helpful to think about where we're coming from. Currently, uh, under the CalAIM initiative, the department is seeking to implement what we call administrative integration. Gary touched on this in his presentation. For behavioral health services in Medi-Cal, uh, currently, uh, counties operate two separate systems. Uh, some counties have come closer to achieving, uh, uh, you know, uh, progress on the spectrum of integration, but historically, counties have operated uh, mental health plans where they deliver specialty mental health services, and separate from that, they deliver drug medical services, or now most deliver drug medical organized delivery system services. Historically, those were often two separate agencies, even at the county level, um, similar how, to how previously the uh, California Alcohol and Drug Programs was a separate agency from the Department of Mental Health. Um, approximately a decade ago, um, Department of Mental Health and ADP moved into DHCS. Counties, um, you know, just at the administrative level are integrating, so it's one behavioral health agency. But right now, state laws, state regulations, contracts that counties hold with the department are separate for mental health and for substance use disorder. And of course, physical health care, medical benefits are an entirely separate delivery system in Medi-Cal. Um, those are uh, primarily covered through risk-based managed care plans under realignment, which is in our state's constitution counties have the obligation and the responsibility for providing behavioral health care. Under CalAIM administrative integration, the department is seeking to integrate mental health and substance use disorder into a combined integrated behavioral health um, delivery system. Uh, I want to be clear, that would, that would achieve administrative integration so that we seek to align our laws, our regulations, our contracting, our policies, um, for uh, administrative purposes, that what that does not do is full clinical integration. So it does not mean it is achieving 100% patient-centered care where they can walk into one facility and have all of their needs met. That is the goal. We do need to get there. Um, and I think administrative integration is the first step uh, in, that, in that path. I hope that was helpful to the comments. Can I make a comment? Um, Commissioner, I, uh, I, I just have a question. So when you say it, it's that's the goal, timeline, is that a human-centered approach? I mean, because what we saw, we're talking lives today. We're talking, you know, hourly. So, and knowing, I mean, it sounds like we already know what we need to do and what Commissioner Carnevale is saying, you know, now, we need to do now. So, Tell me what that looks like. Um, and then we're talking about equity issues. We're talking about the, there's a very certain population and that population, we know what that population looks like. So how quickly, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, there's, you know, a lot of opportunity um, and a lot of responsibility in almost every part of the healthcare system. I think, you know, under the state opioid response grant funding that I walked through, we've been supporting federally qualified health centers, uh, primary care, med physical care providers to be able to address addiction, to provide medications, buprenorphine. Um, that's an example that, you know, they can they can do that. And it's a matter of clinical practice transformation. 
um, you know, change management, um, building will at the provider organization level, having leadership support, having clinical training to do it. Um, I think same on the on the substance use disorder side, on the mental health side, being able to provide clinically integrated care is often uh, a matter of um, you know providing resources to support um, uh, you know the sustainability and the practice change at the organizational level. Um, so I think this is an area that the entire nation is struggling with, um, and I'm happy to you know continue conversations about how we can support providers to integrate care delivery. Thank you. I Can I ask one follow-up to that? Please, Commissioner so, Janovich. Um, uh, thank you, Tyler, and, and thank you for your overview of the system in California. There is a lot that DHCS has done to set the table and uh, in terms of adopting standards and aligning payment to facilitate where we need to go. I think the exasperation that you hear is that we all wanna see this accelerated and it's not clear how we can accelerate it. Today, we're talking about a initiative where we have a small pot of money, but $20 million that we can potentially place into accelerating some part of this. And interested in your thoughts, understanding both what the opportunity is and the enormous gaps between the high level standards and plans and payment reform that's been established at the state level and then the barriers when you come all the way down to the programs that are contracted to deliver the services that won't integrate the change that haven't yet raised their level of care that are not certified that uh that, that create all the barriers we then see at the person level so what are your thoughts about what some of the most compelling addressable opportunities are that would accelerate that reform sure thank you commissioner um you know, I think that you know uh, the the site visits that um, that members participated on yesterday. Um, I you know showed I think what can happen uh, when there is will and there are resources to meet people where they are. Um, and I think if we are to sort of save save lives and address uh, the individuals facing the greatest risk um, and the greatest inequities. Um, providing low barrier care, including through street medicine or outpatient clinics that offer, you know, easy access, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, opportunities for people to receive evidence-based care, including medications, immediately on the front end, while a lot of the administrative challenges that are inherent to the health insurance model in the United States are sort of um, you know, deprioritized um, and really prioritizing patients first. So I think it's that low barrier care approach, that model, that philosophy that, you know, uh, pockets across California have been able to achieve, um, like some of my co-panelists today, that I think is a really important opportunity um, in terms of, um, you know, in, in immediate uh, small scale support. Because we heard a lot about the impact uh, of these programs in leading to initiation, but there's very there's a lot less data on continuation, and and so that the the focus of the question really is what happens after somebody's initiated when somebody needs care within the substance use the specialty substance use system, what we can do to accelerate and improve care within that. That's a fantastic question. Um... I think that we are um, beginning to facilitate dialogue and resources for pro SUD providers in California to help uh, sort of further our understanding and have solutions to answer that question. How do we lower the thresholds of care? How do we meet people who aren't quite ready? Um, I think Gary touched on this in his remarks. Um, the department is organizing harm reduction workshop summits where we're convening um, stakeholders across the state to um, uh, talk about exactly that question. How do we get someone in the door and how do we keep them in, in the door? How do we keep them in treatment? How do we lower the bar um, so that our treatment models are not designed for people who are fully motivated, fully committed, perfect patients, but rather the majority of people suffering and struggling from substance use disorder who need help, who want help, and who need uh, the system to evolve. Um, we're actually contracting with the American Society of Addiction Medicine to develop clinical uh, clinical guidelines. I think they're called clinical considerations 
to address this precise question. Um, how, how do we develop uh, uh, policies and procedures that embrace and embody and implement the philosophies of patient-centered care within a chronic disease management framework and really put harm reduction practices into work at the SUD treatment setting? Um, so these are just excellent questions and it's something that I'm beginning to work with stakeholders and work with my department on. Ma Madam Chair, I, I would just reiterate my point. I appreciate system integration is a great objective. We also heard, I think, from Dr. Mullen that a high percentage of the issues are outside the immediate system. And I, I think a big issue here is we do not have a clear definition of the problem. And until we have that, you, we're not designing all of the right solutions to get to outcomes that are going to be different. We have failed outcomes here. And so, again, I would take a patient-centered invest in a design process that we can clearly elevate, identify the, 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 the frustrations and the problems and begin to elevate solutions from, from the patient side of this equation while we're trying to move the, you know, the, the, the uh, system around. Thank you, Commissioner Carnevale. And I would say, um, you know, I, I hear kind of the steps that you mentioned, Tyler, start with the administrative integration, which is not clinical integration. And I would just say, I want to hear, start with the people on the street first, and then backflow to the administrative and the clinical. That's what I want to see as we're stepping around and stepping over. And I'm seeing, you know, people who are suffering and, and yet they still, you know, as they see us walking by, wherever they are in, the, in their suffering and their addiction, and they still have the presence of mind to, you know, fix their here. It's still that human dignity. And, and that's what I'm seeing. And so when I hear language like, you know, the administrative integration, I don't hear the people first. That's where I'm struggling with it. And, and I know it's a process, Tyler, and, and I want the conversations to keep happening, and I know we're working towards it. So I just needed to say that out loud. And um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Commissioner Bench. I think you had a question, so please. I, yes, thank you. I had a follow-up question, Tyler. You mentioned several times the need for low-barrier care, and I think I'm missing what's preventing that. What is it that's preventing the, the low barrier care that's needed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it's a combination of um, sort of initial infrastructure and uh, support. Um, uh, it's hard to create something out of nothing. Um, I think it's a matter of uh, sort of clinical, you know, changing clinical practice and the sort of, you know, policies and procedures in the clinical setting. Um, and then to some extent, funding, uh, I think, is needed because, uh, you know, uh, as, I think as Dr. Mullen highlighted, if health insurance, if someone does not have health insurance or if someone's health insurance, you know, their eligibility uh, is not active um, or uh, for whatever reasons we all know, there are administrative challenges um, to reimbursement in a medical insurance model. Um, sometimes funding is needed for that as well. And there are funding streams available, uh, grant funding, other dedicated funding outside of Medi-Cal, outside of insurance, um, but that that can be a challenge as well. So I think it's a combination of clinical, administrative, and financial uh, uh, things that need to be tackled. Commissioner Gordon, please. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I heard Dr. Molin speak to the fact that once the the emergency was over the the person was rescued and and stabilized then there was the period of, of adaptation to treatment which had to be uh, appropriate treatment and what would it take dr molan to make sure that the treatment post rescue was completely appropriate because it sounds like people are getting sent off to whatever, whatever place is available or services available. But what would it take to pilot uh, an appropriate way of doing that, a more effective way of doing that? You know, great question. And I think about 
this low threshold clinic piece, I think is really the key where you could locate clinics in areas of high need that could be walk-in welcoming um, in order for people to continue buprenorphine that was started in the emergency department or on the streets where people could come in and access treatment primarily. And in that setting, which would ideally be welcoming with peer supports, those clinics could stabilize people some could go back into the dual diagnosis clinic. Some could ideally go back to primary care where you could get diabetes treatment, HIV treatment, depression. Um, but to have a place where people, anyone can enter the system and not be struggled with your insurance. The beautiful thing about the emergency department and why our model has worked is because it is the only place where healthcare is a right. You show up in the emergency department in whatever state with no ID, with no immigration status, and healthcare is a right. And if we brought that ethos to an outpatient clinic where someone could come back, where they could receive treatment, and maybe they come to that clinic for a year, two years, a month, just one time before they transfer out to a long-term solution, I think that answer would fill in this gap and allow people to access treatment when they needed, how they needed on their own terms, something that allowed walk-ins. Um, there is a model, there's the Highland Bridge Clinic, which is a low threshold access clinic. And then my colleague, Dr. Trotsky, sir, also has that low threshold model, but it's really, you know, the question is like, what is the barrier? The barrier is the way that we finance healthcare, right? Because we finance healthcare based on these different funding streams, but it's, it's the person who needs the care. And so we know the barrier is like the way that we finance healthcare in this country. Um, and I mean, it's this sort of kind of corrupt capitalist system and that's what we have. And it is not designed to work for people. And in this situation where people are really struggling and the disease process, I mean, you know this with mental illness, it's kind of the same. Your disease process makes it harder for you to overcome some of these barriers that we put in front of you. And so because of that, we have to overcompensate in our delivery system to make it easy for people. I often think you know we make it hardest for the people to access service who have the hardest time getting there. We put more barriers in front of that patient population when we should strategically put less. So I, I would say invest in a network of low threshold access clinics um, that take advantage of a lot of the amazing changes that have been in place in CalAIM, but also allow people to walk in and take that healthcare is a right view that works so well in the emergency department. Yes, thank you, uh, I thank you, Dr. Molenbeke. I, I, and I, I would just say that I think the the financing part of it is uh, is really if if you don't solve this problem, you're going to spend money over and over and over again with more emergency treatment for the person <laughs> until the person dies, and then and then they're off our books. But uh, I don't know, maybe. Uh, uh, Steve Carnavali, maybe this is something we could we could try the approach that uh, that Dr. Molin suggests as a pilot with some of the money that we have available. Thank you, Thank Madam you. Chair. Can I just uh, briefly? I won't go into a lot of detail, but I, just last week when we were in New York at the end of our our Brain Capital Summit uh, as part of the UN Science Summit, uh, I was invited to the uh, Danish Embassy, and I heard a presentation on a public-private partnership that Denmark has between industry and their insurance providers and government and foundations, and they've all come together. And even the pharma companies have said they're willing to modify their profit objectives in order to pull together a system that serves more people. And I think you know, going after the financing end of this is absolutely something that should be done. And again, we can just live in the system and integrate it or we can change the system. And I recommend we try to change it. Thank you, Commissioner Carnavali. So I echo everything you've been saying and 
also say it's both and, right? As we're rebuilding a system that makes these outcomes possible, we have to design these low barrier strategies. And you saw some of that yesterday. You saw, you know, welcome, I'm so glad you're here. No matter what, I want you to have my phone number. Here it is, this is my direct line. Um, any barrier you have, we've worked really hard to help you overcome that. If something happens and you weren't able to pick up your meds, just come back. I put a refill in the pharmacy. You don't have insurance to pick up that med. That pharmacy has a spend down account, so you can just pick up that medication. You need somebody to go pick up that medication for you and bring it back to your tent. You have somebody doing that for you. So we just really um, lovingly thought through every single barrier one could possibly face after starting treatment in our hospital, in our ER, you know, there's a hotline you can call. We will come and see you no matter what. We can do a video visit. You live in Lancaster, okay, you have outside insurance. We have a community benefit hotline that you can also call. So it just is really having these dedicated um, reimagining of how we deliver healthcare so that it's extra, right? It's that concierge service for people in the most need. And, you know, often it's unfortunate, the reverse, right? I have private Kaiser insurance and I have that concierge app on my phone. Like we need that same level of attention and detail and caring to people who are the most unlikely to have that historically. I appreciate that. So I wanna thank you again for being here. And what I would like to do is have staff work closely with Commissioner Danovich and Commissioner Carnivali to really just, and with panel members as the experts and of course with our peer community, to come up with some ideas of how we could move forward with this, where we could put that funding toward and what, what, what a design or a pilot would look like. So if we can do that, we will move this conversation forward um, or the planning forward. And I, this time I would like to, um, again, thank you for being here. We are gonna have public comment um, since we have no other further conversation or questions from our commissioners. We'll move forward with public comment. So now is the time that members of the public may request to make a public comment on agenda item five by clicking the raise hand button on your computer or the app or if calling in by phone, push star nine. Once the public comment period for this agenda item starts, we will close the public comment queue. So please make your request to comment now. Also, please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Amariani, are there any public comments? Please raise your hand now as the queue will be closing. So we currently have one public comment in the room and then four online. Um, in the room, we have Steve McNally. Uh, hi, my name is Steve McNally. I'm from Orange County. I'm on a behavioral health advisory board, like every county has one LA Mental Health Commission, which I'm sure their people will be here, but they have a conflicting meeting. I speak as an individual. My background is mostly mental health, and um, but all these issues are all interconnected. You know, for me, people make a difference, and it's obvious from your panelists, they figure out how to make a difference, but we don't have a culture that is honest and presents problems as well as solutions. We're so focused on, as our guy, the new head of Coloptima talks about is the acrylic silos and worshiping them versus just fixing the problem. And some of the biggest, um, some of the biggest solutions, like let's say for housing would be existing housing to get reconnected people back in and reuni reunified. So substance use, serious mental health, they're the most disconnected people. And yet we have to wonder why we have a system that doesn't embrace the simple solution. Any business knows that a receptionist knows more about their uh, clientele or at the low level, but it's very difficult. I attend a lot of meetings and it's very difficult to have anyone uh, from who actually used the system to be included. And so, California, um, I'm, I say this a lot almost at every meeting, but um, I'm going to say it for Gary's benefit because I didn't get a chance to see him and Ronnie and the Inland Empire guy at the Department of Healthcare Services. Those four counties, LA, Orange County, Riverside, San Bernardino, represent 45% of, uh, of California, one TV market, one radio market, two newspaper groups, and that's counting the LA Times as a group. Uh, and that anything else that you do, that's just general market, not ethnic market. So um, 
there's a tremendous opportunity, suicide, opiates. So that's one thing I think we could do collectively. Um, the other is culture. School, everyone can order Narcan. Almost anybody can order it. And we've been setting up a separate distribution for families because a lot of pharmacies don't carry it or you get judgment. But you know who doesn't order it in bulk is police departments, schools. Uh, they order enough to have and someone dies and is, is overdoses in front of you. But their culture isn't to just acknowledge the problem and to freely uh, make sure that families are empowered to handle it. And the hospital navigator program is incredible, but I'm not sure how many families even know it exists outside of if you go there. And the goal is not to have to go there. So um, even, in, even in my county, I can't tell you, whoops, yeah. I can't do two things at once. Uh, did you enjoy that? <laughs> Stop. Stop. All right. So uh, I'll end that there. But pe I, the, the thing it is, is that people make a difference. And we have a lot of bureaucracy in our system, whether it's private or public. And you're focusing a lot on homeless, which is very important, but it's relatively small versus the whole piece of the pie. And I think Cal Aim we talk as if it's actually happening. It's very aspirational and terrific, but it's not actually happening in a lot of places in any kind of scale. So I would just ask us to be honest. And also um, people need to hear honesty and has to be okay. We're here and we don't wanna be here. I wanna be with those four people. Let's just collectively own how we got here, quit being so defensive and just get someplace else. So thanks for letting me um, speak today. Thank you. Um, next we have Richard, your line is open. Hello, Richard Gallo from Santa Cruz, California. I wanna thank the panelists for their expertise of what they shared. It's knowledgeable, it's facts, and what they stated, it's truly needed in our communities because our communities is not equitable to those populations that are not being served of access to care that they need. The other thing is the 5,000 peer workers at Cal Mesa has already invested with nowhere to go because the state agencies chose to not include peer workers in the Cal AIM or the Modernization Act. And we will lose funding more than half if the bill gets passed with Proposition 1. That's a big if. This is why I'm upset with the commission that supported SB 326. You're devoting less funding for counties by diverting for other purposes and needs. Does not focus on the intent of the MHSA Act. We need people like Tommy who will do the work. I'm one of them. I have helped consumers, seniors, people with disability, unhoused community to navigate through the system, to provide the support while they're trying to recover, to provide the needs to get them out of homelessness. It can be done. Let's do in navigation centers by providing peers along with the medical community to support these individuals in their recovery. Let's partner with community health clinics. Each county has a community health clinic. Let's partner with them, with peer workers to help our vulnerable communities that's not being served, especially the unhoused community. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Laurel, your line is open. Good morning. This has been a really interesting morning. Uh, and I wanted to recall a story that our beloved Janet King of the Native American Healthcare Center in Oakland once told. She said that when their center opened, I think it's on International Boulevard in Oakland, there were what are, were called Indian bars all along that boulevard where Native Americans 
with addictions to alcohol spent a lot of time. Gradually, as the Native American Healthcare Center introduced its culturally uh, community-defined evidence practices, there weren't customers anymore for those Indian bars. People were going to the Native American Healthcare Clinic to get care that wasn't, it may have, they may have included medi medications. I don't know that they didn't, but they definitely included culturally defined evidence-based practices. And so I would ask, in addition to considering a statewide network of uh, clinics, as the uh, uh, speakers have suggested, that you also look hard at the CDEPs for those that may be able to help with this current crisis that we're in. And remember Janet King. The second thing I just wanted to add, only because uh, it was just mentioned, I happen to live in Sacramento County. And last year I went to probably three all day conferences about opioids and or peer support. And the opioid summits for Sacramento County and Placer County were held by federal law enforcement, local law enforcement, and there was a heavy presence of the Sacramento area uh, school personnel and probably Placer County too. Now their emphasis wasn't on people living in the streets. Their emphasis was on high school students who are under stress and might try just once or twice. They think they might get help when they're stressed on exams and they might try something and die because of the fentanyl laced into other medications that they can get online. They, tra they trained everybody in that, those conferences on how to use Narcon and they handed it out to everybody walking out. Even I got that. So uh, if, if, if a grandma from Muslim American Society Social Services Foundation in Remco can Thank get you, Narcon can for free. Comment. Your three minutes are up. Okay, look at Sacramento County. Talk to, uh, you, have, you have the school uh, commission lead there on your commission. Thank you. Uh, next we have Kim, your line is open. Great, thank you so much. I, I appreciate the panel and everything that was shared. I wanna, uh, take a little bit of a different and very specific lens that I think Dr. Sai had started to mention that is um, such a critical piece. So we work, my organization, the California Youth Advocacy Network, we work very closely with youth and young adults on uh, social justice youth development to ensure that youth and young adults are at the forefront of changing the communities and environments that may lead to substance use behavior. And what we try to do is prevent it to before it ever gets to a point of needing um, the SUDS treatment that you all are discussing today. But I want to note from a K-12 space, one of the biggest challenges that we have right now is that the systems where young people go to school, in fact, criminalize youth use, substance use and possession. We had legislation that would have prevented this, at least from a tobacco lens. And um, unfortunately, it got stuck in committee. And so even if schools have intention of doing intervention, there might not be funding to do it. And the system in which they exist actually encourages suspension and detention for youth substance use, which is highly, highly problematic. And then I think we also need to look at that when we talk about treatment, we aren't getting down to the root causes of why young people are using. And this is where there's that intersection of mental health and substance use. So how do we collectively address this? This is something our team is actually looking at from a college perspective, because as Dr. Sai had shared, and this is so relevant for young people, that many young people who use substances may not want help quitting or even believe that they have a disorder or an addiction that needs support in quitting. But if we change that lens and we integrate it with a mental health, we'll be more successful. And so when we look at data from the national college surveys, we find that the majority of young people who experience a mental health condition are willing to get support and care for that condition. 
But if they use tobacco, marijuana, or alcohol, they will not get support. So how do we integrate these two streams so that if somebody is seeking medical care, they're screened for substance use and for mental health? If they're seeking care for the mental health, how are they also screened for substance use? So we really need to, again, break down the silos within public health. I work in tobacco, but every young person we work with that is using tobacco is either suffering from a mental health condition or at risk of using a cannabis product or currently using a cannabis product. We need to integrate it all. We need to have these conversations and we need to be engaging young people to change these systems that are actually perpetuating the harm. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And then we have our last public comment, Stacy. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Stacy Hiramoto with the uh, REMCO, the Racial and Ethnic Mental Health Disparities Coalition. Really want to thank the Commission for putting this panel on. I am really um, remembering Dr. David Pading, former Commissioner. I think most of you know him. He would be so pleased that this panel was put on. And I want to thank the speakers, especially those that uh, addressed disparities and communities that uh, do not just go with the mainstream. So I'm just asking that if the commission does uh, vote to allocate Mental Health Wellness Act funds for a program that special attention or language is inserted so that um, community defined evidence practices can be utilized and that um, underserved communities will be addressed also. Thank you again. Thank you, Stacy. So with that, um, I want to thank again the panel for being here. And um, we are going to um, thank uh, Commissioner Danovich to work with panel members, peers, and staff to design a proposal so that we can invest in a response to SUD needs. And we will bring that back in November. So. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so, Commissioner Dianovich. <laughs> Again, thank you everyone. 